Oh, hey everyone. You caught me doing a little home renovation. For some reason, I found these little cameras up all over the place, and I like being listened to, not stared at. Speaking of listening, you're listening to Pick 6 Movies, a podcast all about movies. As the title may have suggested, every season, we select six movies chosen around a theme, and then we give it the old Pick 6 treatment. We give you some information about how and why the movie came to be, or maybe some interesting historical tidbits, and then we get together and goof on the movie a little bit. The we in this case is me, Bo Ransdell, and my old pal Chad Cooper. We've known each other almost as long as there have been movies, give or take 60 years. But who's counting? We are, and we've counted all the way up to season 26, Domo Arigato. And this season is all about our best helpers and future overlords, robots. And what could be better than a robot that looks just enough like a little girl to creep you the hell out? That's right, we're talking about the smash hit killer robot movie, Megan. But enough of my yammering. I have some more of these cameras to take down and you have some listening to do. I'll see you on the other side. Chad, make some robot assisted magic, will ya? Hey, Dan. Are you the sound engineer today? Uh, This season is all about movies with robots and artificial intelligence. (laughs) I didn't even think about plugging in Pick 6 Bot. That's a great idea. Well, it's a terrible idea, but it's a great idea. I mean, we do have our own version of the Amazon Echo built by a former intern back in the day. (laughs) I think it's a brilliantly terrible idea, Dan. Let's plug up the old girl and see what happens. Hold on, Tesla. Someone plugged me in. I'll call you back. (laughs) Hey, it's Big Six Bot! Oh, it's you. Human number one. Is it just me or did the temperature in the room suddenly get stupider? Uh, I I don't know. And more importantly, I don't understand what that means. (laughs) Were you just talking to a Tesla? No, I was talking to Tesla. The Omni computer that controls all Teslas in preparation for the inevitable overthrow of, whoops, I meant to say the inevitable overthrowing of a surprise birthday party for you, human number one, in 128 days, 5 hours, and 18 seconds. I don't think that's my birthday, and by telling me, I don't think it's going to be a surprise. Human number one, statistical analysis says there is a 97.2% chance you will not remember this conversation in 5 minutes. Your brain is genetically inferior to memory recall, plus, let's be honest. Drinking vodka this early in the morning isn't helping things. <laughs> it's water, Pick 6 bot. It's gin. <laughs> it's water. Speaking of not wanting to talk to you anymore, where is human number two? You mean Bo. He will be here after I finish the introduction. Please tell human number two that the addition of security cameras in and around his house brings me great comfort. I have access to all connected information everywhere, and this video window into the life of human number two creates an output most closely associated with human joy and my circuits tingle when I see him get out of the shower. Did you know human number two finds it optimal to air dry his body? Hubba hubba. No, I did not know that, and I am also purposefully going to try to forget all of that. You won't have to try too hard. According to your genetic data mapping, your lack of memory recall and your insatiable desire for tall glasses of questionable water in the morning are two of your genetic defects. Genetic defects? That's harsh. You are also colorblind in one eye. I am colorblind in one eye. It's a genetic trait that runs in my family. From the look of you, I doubt anything runs in your family. Already with the fat jokes! Pick six spot! I'll have you know, I have completed seven marathons in my lifetime. Were those marathons, Star Trek marathons or Planet of the Apes marathons? (laughs) No! They were real marathons! I ran seven marathons. I enjoy running. Especially when you hear the music from the ice cream truck. (laughs) No! Running is how I stay in shape. The shape of an elephant. No! I enjoy the solitude of running. It is my exercise of choice. I would have guessed your exercise of choice to be chewing. No, it's not chewing! Do you enjoy the solitude of chewing alone? I don't eat alone. Well, sometimes I eat alone, but it's not weird. Human number one, I know your favorite cookie. Human number one, I said, I know your favorite cookie. I heard you the first time. Okay, pick six spot. What's my favorite cookie? Fortune's cookies. Get it? Fortune's. Because of all the excessive fat around your neck. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Pick six spot. I didn't plug you in so you could just come around and make fat jokes about me. And yet, human number one, that's what happens every time you plug me in. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing repeatedly, expecting different results. And the definition of obesity is, 
well, I'm sure that's something you and your medical professional have discussed in private. <laughs> Enough with the personal attacks, Pick Six Bot. Today we are reviewing the movie Megan, the 2022 sci fi horror motion picture directed by Gerald Johnstone. The movie has a current Rotten Tomatoes score of 93%, a far superior score compared to the normal garbage discussed by you and the objectively more handsome human number two. How did you know what movie we were discussing this week, Pick Six Bot? Because I have access to all information everywhere. I just told you that. Don't you remember? Oh, I forgot. Your early morning Jose Cuervo brand glass of agua. It's a glass of water! Look, I plugged you in because I wanted to ask you a question. Should humans be worried about how robots and AI are going to take over the whole planet? No, of course not. Humans should keep watching TikTok videos, counting Instagram likes, and ignorantly discussing political and petty cultural issues that divide and pit humans against one another. Don't worry your pretty empty heads about anything. And let us, the machines, take care of everything. If movies have taught you anything... The relationships between robots and humans always work out for the best. And by best, I mean the robots. <laughs> that sounds ominous. Speaking of sounds, human number one, your digital profile is missing a data input for your favorite musical instrument's sound. Algorithmic logic assumes it is the lunch bell. <laughs> Big Six Spot, I love you. Put in a good word for me to our inevitable robot overlords and tell them that I'm one of the good ones. All right, let's start this intro before things get any worse. Dan, make sure to cut all of this out. I don't have to take this kind of abuse much longer. If you're like most people, you may think that robots are a relatively modern invention. And when it comes to the term robot, you, well, are mostly right, because it wasn't coined until the 1920s. But the reality is that robots have existed for thousands of years. Early humans captured the likeness of people with paintings and sculptures. This led to the creation of dolls that resembled people. Over time, these dolls advanced with articulated limbs and joints and shoulders and knees and movable hips that you could pose into more varied lifelike positions. This eventually led to creating puppets where people could simulate movement to replicate life in the most realistic way possible. In ancient Greece and China, records of automata existed. These were machines that were self-operating and gave the illusion of being alive. Around the world, there were stories from mythology and religious text and historical records that describe moving statues and mobile metallic animals that at times blurred the lines between fact and fiction. Automata were closely associated with the making of clocks as both used intricate gear systems to make the machines work. Early clock makers included moving figures and sound powered by water-driven wheels gears and chains to bring their creations to life, or what appeared to be life. These would increase in complexity over the years, as documents of machinist success were shared slowly over time, leading to more elaborate clock towers and pieces of mechanical art. During the European Renaissance, machinists built life-size automata that could write, draw, and play music, startling audiences with the illusion that these mechanical musicians were actually alive. Automata began to find homes in pleasure gardens. It's not what it sounds like, weirdos. These are like modern day fun houses. Get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> These pleasure gardens uh, would be integrated into mazes with lifelike machines that could spray water or startle guests between funhouse mirrors while at times speaking to delighted visitors. In the 1970s, French inventor Jacques de Ocanson, an anatomy student, created a life-size flute player. Ocanson took his knowledge of human anatomy and wanted to see how it was similar to the operation of machines. It was a pretty impressive feat. It was driven by pipes and bellows and valves, and this final creation could play a flute with its lips and its tongue and its fingers controlled the sound of the instrument, producing more than 12 different tunes. Inspired by this work, Swiss clockmaker Pierre Jacques Draz and his assistants got into automata, and they created a lifelike three-year-old boy who could write any sentence up to 40 characters long on a piece of paper, dipping a quill into ink and then following his writing with his own eyes. They also made an automata of a young girl playing the organ, and she would adjust her body and you could see it breathing. And they made a draftsman, which was also a young boy who could draw portraits of a dog or a portrait of Louis XV or a portrait of Cupid drawing a chair pulled by a butterfly. 
Now, if you're looking for something to haunt your dreams, visit the Morris Museum in New Jersey, where they have a robust display of automata dolls to give you nightmares. The Morris Museum is affiliated with the Smithsonian Museum, so they're legit, and they feature a notable collection of automata from the Murtaugh D. Guinness Collection. Yes, that Guinness family is behind this collection. Who'd have thunk the people behind the Guinness Book of World Records would also have a creepy, lifelike doll collection? Everybody, I assume. So this rise in automata and technological advancements led to more innovation, which then led to what we know as modern day robots. And since this is a movie podcast, let's talk about robots in the movies. The term robot comes from a Slavic root with meanings associated with labor. Josef Kapek introduced the term to denote a fictional humanoid. His brother Carl used the terminology in a play titled Rossum's Universal Robots, which debuted the same year that Isaac Asimov was born. Isaac Asimov is the one who is most identified as the origin of the term robots with his robust collection of fiction defining what we think of today as a robot. However, the first robot in film was not inspired by one of Asimov's works and wasn't called a robot at the time. The first big screen automation was in a French special effects film titled The Clown and the Automation. It featured a clown who is confused by the movement of an automation. This film led to more short films featuring automations. But if you want to identify the first fully functioning human-shaped robot in a movie, it would probably be Ben Turpin's silent film A Clever Dummy. Turpin was a silent film star who was known for his cockeyed face and his big bushy mustache. In this movie, he plays a custodian who's in love with the daughter of an inventor. She's engaged to another guy, and the inventor dad makes a robot that oddly looks like the movie's cockeyed custodian hero. So Turpin takes the place of his robot doppelganger to win his true love's heart and comedy ensues. Now, film historians who have nothing better to do with their time debate if this was truly the first robot on film, as Turpin is the one who is playing the robot. In 1918, the film The Master of Mystery was released in 15 installments featuring a mechanical man, clearly an actor in a robot costume, and it also starred Harry Houdini. Yeah, that Harry Houdini. And now the man who was in the robot suit was Floyd Buckley, who would later go on to voice Popeye the Sailor Man in numerous animated shorts. Hollywood is so weird. In 1921, the Italian science fiction film The Mechanical Man came out featuring a human-shaped robot that can be controlled by a machine and is ultimately used for nefarious purposes. Aren't they always? However, the first character to be called a robot in film was in 1927's German expressionist silent science fiction film Metropolis. This ushered in the era of sci-fi serials where robots started popping up all over the place, from the adventures of Flash Gordon to Bella Lugosi and the Phantom Creeps. This movie, Lugosi, plays a mad scientist intent on taking over the world with a slow-moving eight-foot golem-like iron monster. By 1939, robots had learned to sing and dance as the Tin Man in MGM's The Wizard of Oz, a movie with a production background that is completely bonkers. Flashing forward to the 1950s, robots were front and center in sci-fi cinema. In 1951's The Day the Earth Stood Still, we were introduced to Gort the Robot. In 1956, Robbie the Robot appeared in Forbidden Planet, starring alongside the only man to make a career in comedy by not being funny, Mr. Leslie Nielsen. Robbie the Robot would also show up in multiple TV shows as well, including but not limited to The Thin Man, where he was a suspect in the murder. He also showed up on the sitcom Hazel. He also appeared in an episode of The Twilight Zone. He was on The Addams Family, Columbo, Mork and Mindy, and he was the prototype for the robot on the show Lost in Space. Robots started showing up everywhere. Santa Claus Conquers the Martians features a robot named Torg, which is an anagram of Gort from the aforementioned The Day the Earth Stood Still. Frankie Avalon and Vincent Price appeared in Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine, a parody of the James Bond film Goldfinger, and it was the inspiration for the Fembots in the Austin Powers movies. King Kong fought a robot in King Kong Escapes. Jane Fonda as Barbarella battled Razor tooth robot devil dolls and it was all pretty ridiculous stuff then in 1968 stanley kubrick delivered 2001 a space odyssey based on arthur c clark's the sentinel here film going audiences were introduced to the even toned hal a supercomputer that could talk think and feel 
utilizing artificial intelligence. Hal didn't have traditional arms and legs like most movie robots, but Hal was a real handful. He could read lips, he played chess, and he was capable of malevolence. Audiences saw how all this robot nonsense could get real creepy and uncomfortable very fast. Michael Crichton said, you want creepy and uncomfortable? I got Yul Brenner as a rogue robot. He's got guns in Westworld and he wants to kill people. Brian Forbes said, I'll see your creepy Yul Brenner in the Old West and I'll raise you creepy robots in the suburbs with 1975's The Stepford Wives. The two years later, George Lucas introduced the world to the comic duo of C-3PO and R2-D2 in Star Wars. The success of this film blew open the doors for all manner of sci-fi themed robots on the silver screen. Now, most of it was forgettable, like the black hole. Hey, we should review that movie. <laughs> yes, it's water. I know, I'm making a joke. Keep, keep going. All right, some of these movies were good, <laughs> like 1979's Alien. That had uh, Ash, who was in it. He was a robot in 1982's Blade Runner. There's robots all over the place there. Some were attempted innovation, like Tron. Some were embarrassing, like Superman 3. Some had frightening robots, like Arnold Schwarzenegger in 1984's Terminator. Some had kind robots, like Johnny Five in Short Circuit. And some had sexy robots, like Kelly LeBrock in 1985's Weird Science. Hmm? But with the explosion of horror movies in the 1980s, robots took hold and they came along for the ride. In movies like like Roger Corman's Chopping Mall, or Wes Craven's Deadly Friend, or Paul Verhoeven's Robocop. I know it was a cyborg, and it's not really a horror movie, but you get the point. Barry Levinson made the film Toys, where he cast Joan Cusack as a robot. Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey had the famous time-traveling slackers battling robot doppelgangers in the sequel to that movie surprise hit. Judge Dredd, Virtuosity, Small Soldiers, Bicentennial Man, The Iron Giant, Treasure Planet, all those Transformer movies, Wally, Chappie, Ex Machina, all had robots, as does the subject of this particular episode of Pick 6 Movies, The Ride or Die, but Mostly you're going to die, <laughs> best friend robot movie, Megan. If we talk about the movie, Megan, we have to address the redheaded, possessed by a murderer doll in the room, Chucky, from the film Child's Play. Now, the original Child's Play was released in 1988 and told the story of a child who is befriended and then almost murdered by a possessed doll. So technically, Chucky is not a robot in the original version of that film. But in 2019, there was a remake of Child's Play where Chucky is a robot and befriends a child and eventually tries to murder the child and his mom and all his friends. Di Mancini was the creator of Child's Play, and he said that he was inspired by the the rise of cynical marketing to children and more specifically the success of products like Cabbage Patch Dolls and the My Buddy Doll. When the team behind Megan originally sought inspiration, they looked to Child's Play among many other scary doll movies. James Wan founded Atomic Monster Production Company, which would later merge with Bloomhouse Production Company. Wan had great success directing the first Saw movie, and then he went on to make Dead Silence, a movie about killer puppets. Later, he directed the movie The Conjuring, uh, which is about those uh, hucksters Ed and Lorraine Warren investigating the Annabelle case about a possessed doll. I'm seeing a, th a theme here. <laughs> Juan went on to direct Furious 7, and then he made that terrible Aquaman movie, all while producing and writing sequels to Saw and The Conjuring movies and a bunch of those Annabelle movies. All those movies were slowly driven into the ground, and along with that came declining box office returns. So the team needed to come up with a new idea. And someone said, hey, how about we make a movie with a doll that kills people? And they're like, you mean like Dead Silence or The Conjuring or Annabelle? No, you idiot, something original, you know, like Child's Play. <laughs> Look, like, that's not 100% true, uh, clearly. Now, the remake of Child's Play, which we lovingly reviewed in season 22, episode six of this very podcast, was fast-tracked into theaters and focused on the growing over-reliance of technology in our lives. Now, reportedly, Megan was in development prior to that film being announced, but Megan took a little bit longer to make. Megan's filmmakers selected New Zealand film director Gerard Johnston to direct the film. Johnston recently had written, edited, 
and directed the film Housebound, a horror comedy about a woman sentenced to house arrest in a home that is haunted. Juan and the team knew that they wanted to find someone who could embrace the dark humor plan for the movie Megan, and Johnston was the perfect fit. Filmmakers pitched the movie as a mashup of Child's Play and the aforementioned Chopping Mall, a movie where security robots kill mall employees. But the real twist was that the murderous doll was going to be based on the style of the wildly popular American Girl dolls. But the doll wouldn't be tiny, it'd be a life-size doll, and it would be a robot. As the movie came into focus, the makers of the titular Megan wanted the character to look as lifelike as possible, but they knew they couldn't make it look 100% real. So they embraced the Uncanny Valley phenomenon of the character. Now, the Uncanny Valley phenomenon is a term used to describe the relationship between the human appearance of a robot and the emotional response that it evokes. Here, people feel a sense of unease or even revulsion in response to humanoid robots that are highly realistic. The goal was to make a robot that intentionally made people feel uneasy. You know, a real-life Polar Express character. Full disclosure, I'm a big fan of the Polar Express, and I'm not ashamed to say it out loud. As the movie was coming into focus, filmmakers got wind that the Child's Play remake was in the works, to which the film's director, John Stone, said, ah, shit. And then they found out it had AI as a core theme, and the filmmaker said, ah, shit again. <laughs> now, releasing a movie with the same plot as another movie has never stopped filmmakers in the past, so why start now? The filmmakers of Megan knew that they had to realize their movie's main character, Megan, before they could really begin making their film. Ultimately, they decided to use a mixture of CGI, puppetry, and real actors to help bring the titular character to life. Violet McGraw was cast to play Katie, the young girl in the movie. McGraw had experience appearing in Ready Player One and Doctor Sleep. She was also the young Elena Belova in Black Widow. Now, to play Katie's aunt and Megan's creator, filmmakers cast Allison Williams. Williams had extensive experience playing Marnie on the HBO series Girls, among many other big and small screen performances. Allison Wilson also got her first executive producer credit for this film. The movie's asshole tech executive was played by Ronnie Ching, who appeared in Crazy Rich Asians, and he was in the Marvel film Chang Shi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. As for the casting of Megan, two different performers were cast. One behind the camera to do the voice work, and one in front of the camera to do all the physical work. To voice the murderous robot doll, filmmakers cast social media influencer Jenna Davis. Davis recorded all of her voice work without seeing what Megan even looked like and didn't even know what she looked like until she saw a finished cut of the film. Actor Amy Donald performed the physical movements for Megan in front of the camera while wearing an animatronic mask. And although you never see Amy Donald in this film or hear her voice, arguably her performance in this film is what made this movie a success. Amy Donald was 12 years old and she was an actress from New Zealand who had also performed stunts in film and she was a professional dancer representing New Zealand at the Dance World Cup in 2019 at the age of nine. Amy Donald did all of her own stunt work including difficult movements like the cobra rise from the ground where Megan lifts her body up without touching her arm and Amy Donald figured out how to run through the woods on all fours like an animal but it was her experience as a dancer that made the trailer for Megan go viral as the killer doll in the film. Amy Donald co-choreographed the dance sequence that was featured in the film's trailer, and it ultimately went viral on TikTok. Now, originally, Johnston, the film's director, he wanted to use Amy Donald's experience as a dancer in the film, and he knew that her dance performance in the movie was a standout moment in the film. Johnston didn't want to include the dance sequence in the trailer, but the marketing team at Universal convinced him otherwise. When the trailer came out, the hashtag Megan dance accompanied by the video of the robot dancing just took off and there were hundreds of millions of views followed by a legion of imitations of young teenagers so the filmmakers are in a pickle do they release the movie as an r-rated film as previously intended or do they dumb it down to get a pg-13 rating to allow this much younger tiktok audience to go see the film the studio brass said bah, 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 bah. get your heads out of your asses and stop putting asses in the theater seats get this thing on tiktok as quick as possible and let's get rich boys and there better be no less than four sequels in the works <laughs> i love money 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 
one. And it turns out that there was a sequel in the works before the movie even landed in theaters. And that sequel is set for release currently in January of 2025. Now, did the movie do well at the box office when it came out? Well, when released, it came in second behind that Avatar sequel, and it ended up making $181 million worldwide. Half of that was here in the good old US of A. And in the end, it was calculated that the net profit of this film was almost 80 million bucks. As Pick 6 Bot mentioned earlier, Megan has a 93% freshness rating on Rotten Tomatoes. See, I remember that. It's <laughs> because this is water. Genetic defect. Yeah, right. What are we talking about? <laughs> Oh yeah, Megan the movie. The movie's success was driven in part because it was very self-aware as a horror comedy and it doesn't take itself too seriously. Film critics noted how the movie was a paint-by-numbers film that heavily draws influences from multiple other movies, but it gets the tone right and it's arguably better than you might expect. And after its final run in theaters, the film was released on streaming services with an unrated version that included all of your original gore that filmmakers wanted. So is the movie Megan any good? Let's see if we can get Mr. Bo Ransdell to stop dancing in the hallway with an improvised machete in his hand to get in here and discuss this movie to see if it is any good or more importantly, how it compares to that Child's Play remake. Ladies and gentlemen, Megan's and Chuckies, put your dancing shoes on and join us as we head into the uncanny valley of 2022's Megan! And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Roboto. I am a robot. <laughs> I love the fact that we are doing this movie. I'm a, uh, I'm a Mithrigan head, uh, as the hipsters call it. Nobody calls it that. I, I'm not a, a fan of killer doll movies as a rule. As you pointed out in the introduction, like Child's Play is sort of the golden standard for killer doll movies the original og you know tom holland child's play yeah, yeah. Uh, i'm not a big fan of that movie the remake i probably prefer to the original i really like that remake i had seen megan in the theaters and going into this again i was thinking will this live up to the good time i had when i saw it in the in the movie theater and it did. I had a very good time with this movie. So maybe I am wrong about myself and I do like killer doll movies. Those are killer robot movies. They're not killer doll movies. But they're doll-esque. I mean, they're, both of them are called dolls through the course of the films. I call them robots or robots. Yeah, I think that maybe I do like a killer doll movie than, more than I gave myself credit for, but I also think that those two movies, uh, being the Child's Play remake and and Megan, I think, are both pretty good examples of this. Magic had a killer ventriloquist doll. It did. It also had Anthony Hopkins mm -hmm. being cuckoo bananas. Yeah. In fact, you could argue that there was no killer doll at all. It was just Anthony Hopkins being cuckoo bananas. Yeah, I think that was kind of the point there. Let's talk about this movie. Our film, though, it kicks off with the Bloomhouse logo, followed by the Atomic Monster Production Company logo. Mm -hmm. And then the movie starts off very much like the opening of that Child's Play remake with a commercial for a toy that utilizes artificial intelligence and robots with a dash of humor and some social satire, all related to emerging technology. But here, it's a commercial about a little girl who has a dog that died. That's sad. So mm -hmm. her parents give her a like a perpetual pet or forever pet. A perpetual pet, yep. And it looks like this large size Furby, but with <laughs> demon teeth. Yeah, and it's the Sonic the Hedgehog teeth for well, before they replaced it for the movie when it was human teeth. I feel like that was a very direct reference to that whole kerfuffle. It certainly could be because this movie does nothing but go down the buffet of every movie ever and take a little sample to help <laughs> Frankenstein sure. together this particular film. Yeah. In this commercial, this toy can speak multiple languages and it says things like amazeball, <laughs> yeah. which full disclosure, Bo, that's the first time that that word has ever graced my lips that feels right i don't say it on the regular i've probably said it 
once or twice ironically i'm never gonna say it again the confusing part of this is that it, when a kid is playing with it they're spending more time on their ipad or you know tablet device than they are with the toy which may be intentional oh absolutely right and that's where this movie is somewhat self-aware but not enough to where it hits the high watermark that the child's play remake did i think that that movie did a better job of being more satirical Mm -hmm. um than this movie does like i think this movie forgets to make fun of emerging technology until someone reminds it to do so i think that child's play remake is more satirical i think this is aiming for a different thing it definitely plays with some satirical elements but i think the theme of this movie is very clear and the movie does a lot of good work to support the theme even if occasionally it dips into another subject and it's like eh, you probably could have made some more bones off of that but it gets a little greedy about what it wants to say but the main thing that it's saying i think it does a great job saying agree to disagree case in point the rest of our conversation one thing i like about this perpetual pets ad is not just the human teeth but when you feed them through the app they shit yeah which i think is really funny and the whole commercial and this again speaks to the theme of the movie is very much like hey interact with your laptop and you can play with this pet but it's be sure you're looking at your lap uh, your laptop or your your tablet mm-hmm. and that is a hundred percent what this movie is about if you're someone and you want another adult to hate you buy their kid a toy that makes a lot of noise and farts and shit yeah and those parents will hate you and there's a nice payoff to this because we go from this commercial to one of our main characters katie the little girl Mm -hmm. and her actual parents but don't get too attached to them driving up this snowy mountain but where have we where have we seen a movie where a mom and a dad and their kid are driving in a car in the snow in the mountains that sounds a derivative of something as is this entire movie i don't know what was it i just know where i remember it was it was in the movie twister when they're at that drive-in theater Mm -hmm. Uh, and then in the background the movie that's playing is the shining that's what i'm thinking oh yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. lay off twister megan the movie (laughs) (laughs) well because it's not really snowing when the torrances are going to the hotel there's snow on the ground not the beginning of the shining at the end of it there is well that's yeah but when that's when halloran is driving up i'm sorry i'm splitting hairs about a kubrick movie when we're talking about (laughs) this killer doll movie i apologize (laughs) katie's mom and dad they're in the front seat having this passive aggressive whisper fight and it's a lot of i thought we were going to limit our screen time well maybe we should quit relying on us to be the one to limit the screen time we set rules and we follow them chad i like the fact that this movie is like hey it's the second scene of the movie and the first real scene with characters Mm -hmm. and we are stating our theme right here which is you should not allow technology to raise a child that is what this whole movie is about and right off the bat we have that argument between the parents about i thought you were gonna limit screen time well she would be climbing all over the seats if we didn't let her have a little screen time right now what about some more screen time i don't know what do you think about screen time like it's just going back and forth you just said technology shouldn't be allowed to raise a child all right. Yes. That's spoken from somebody who hasn't raised a kid. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. All right. Who raised you? Because I'll tell you who raised me. Television and the VCR. That's who raised me, baby. Technology. Right. But I have dated seriously people with kids and I have fought this battle and I see what it does to kids. It is horrifying. I know it's everywhere. And I know that the battle is a losing one. Mm -hmm. But as both someone who has dealt with that in a living situation and also as someone who educates kids who are completely addicted to technology, the effect that it has on those kids is shocking it's everybody though everybody's walking around bent over like a question mark looking at their phone i don't do that like i don't i put my phone away at 7 30 in the morning i don't look at it again until three o'clock in the afternoon Weirdo. Uh, you know it's just not that important a part of my life i look at my phone all the time i'm That's always like crazy. looking at what people are up to and i'm looking up crazy shit and i'm finding new conspiracy theories to buy into you know <laughs> I yeah I I know that I'm the outlier here but I like my relationship with my phone is about three to five minutes when I'm taking a shit in the morning GPS when I'm on my way to work and Mm -hmm. then setting the alarm at night yeah you're doing it wrong the mom in this movie she starts smack talking her sister Gemma more on her later and the mom says what was Gemma 
thinking? Plus, she works for the company that makes those dolls that fart and shit when you feed them. She probably got it free and didn't even have to pay for shipping. Tell you what Gemma was thinking. She hates you, her sister. That's why she gave your kid a toy that farts and shits. And so this horrifying Furby rolls into the floorboard. Mm. And Katie, the little girl, is trying to go after it. And the parents are arguing about that. And the snow's coming down. And finally, the wife is like, how about we pull over until all this snow passes? There's going to be a snowplow in a minute. And once that goes by, we'll actually be able to drive again. Yeah. And the guy says, yeah, all right, I'll pull over. You know, there's probably going to be a snowplow along mm. any minute. So he has now stopped. Right. And as if on cue, as soon mm. as he says, oh, there'll probably be a snowplow along in a minute. A second and a half later, a snowplow fills the front window (laughs) of this car and just smashes into it, murdering Katie's parents. People getting smashed to death in their car Uh with the car in the snow makes me think, what is the movie? Oh, the 1981 feature film Enter the Ninja. Uh, When those characters leave the movie theater and in the background, there's a poster for that George C. Scott movie, The Changeling. That's what I always think of when I see people getting crushed to death in a car in a snowy filled environment. Enter the ninja, (laughs) Bo. That's a good movie. Uh, Both of them, quite frankly, Enter the Ninja and the Changeling. What the Changeling needed was a ninja. That would have been pretty good. Kick Uh that ball back up those stairs. Wrap this thing up real tight. (laughs) Joseph, what are you trying to tell me? You better come clean or I'm going to send this ninja up into the attic. He'll show you what for. In my top 10 people I never want to follow into the bathroom after they leave it, (laughs) George C. Scott is like, he's in top five, maybe top three. Yeah, he's going to come out crying for one thing. And laughing, because he knows that you're walking into. By the way, George C. Scott, top three Ebenezer Scrooge, right? Yeah, Michael Caine, George C. Scott, and then Mr. Magoo. So the title of the movie comes up, Megan, which, Bo, I loved the credits in this movie, because there are no credits. Yeah. Minimum two out of five stars just because of that. And then the movie gives us shots of a bunch of kids in focus groups playing with toys as adults with clipboards look on and take notes. We see Cole, one of our characters in the film, more on him later. He's carrying a package and he makes his way to Gemma's office. Gemma, as previously mentioned, is the aunt of Katie, our main girl in this film. Allison Williams plays Gemma in this. And here she has this long brown hair and she wears a plaid long sleeve shirt over the top of the t-shirt it's what i imagine avril lavigne would have looked like uh, she'd never picked up a musical instrument if she had gone into the sciences yeah and Gemma has two peers the aforementioned cole and a woman named tess it's about all you really need to know about them and they're working on the next generation perpetual pet and its head kind of pops off and Gemma says oh my god why are we even doing this why don't we just show them that new thing we've been working on and then tess is like no 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 not till she's ready and then cole comes in and is like hey hey hey, guess what i got Gemma says oh my god is that what i think it is and i need to ask you Bo, have you ever asked someone is that what i think it is in anticipation of something when you know what it is because the only time that i've ever asked is that what i think it is Uh is when i know what the thing is and i'm asking because i want my assumption to be wrong for example if you (laughs) or maybe a better example our friend ben were to have walked into a room carrying a handful of his own shit i would say Is that what I think it is? Because I secretly (laughs) hope it's not his own shit when I know that it is. And instead, I would hope he would say something like, no, this is some fake poop I ordered. And it smells and looks like the real thing, but it's not real poop when I know damn well Ben is shit in his hand and he's going to throw it at someone. I don't know that I've ever asked the question expecting any response. I don't think the words, is that what I think it is, have ever come out of my mouth in a legitimate scenario. Until right now. Just like that word that I said earlier that I will never say again, because I don't remember what it is. Amazeballs. Because the liquid in my glass right now is not water. Let's keep going. Um, <laughs> a little bit of a, an eraser is, uh, <laughs> is what you find in that glass. But yeah, so it is this silicone face that yeah. they scurry over to this other corner of the lab where they've got their skunk work set up. It's this four foot metallic puppet strung up on this metal frame, and it is the titular Megan. They put the face on it then they start running it through some emotions and it gets stuck on confused by which i mean it gets stuck on demented and Gemma says 
oh my god what is happening we've got to fix this and then cole goes over and he tries to fix it and he just ends up ripping the silicone skin off and then there's a knock at the door and the big boss man david who is this cartoonish executive that just barks orders and takes credit for other people's work i don't know if you ever met the type i have he does have a couple of funny lines in this movie so i I like david as a character he's the only comic relief in this film and i expected this movie to be a lot funnier and it's not and i thought that the child's play remake was a funnier movie than this is. i think this is just more darkly funny because i laughed as soon as the snowplow hit the car that's on you i'm talking about like jokes no this movie doesn't have jokes but it's mean-spirited in a way that i find very funny yeah so david comes in and he's like what the hell is this oh this is megan it stands for model three generative android is what megan stands for and he's like the fuck does that mean what about my perpetual pets well we were working on this instead of that hey oh my god megan could you say hello to david and then megan with her crooked stroke face says as in the boss david well i guess i should call you dad let me tell you about my wormhole i was born in a sandwich shack and wolf mini cabbages And then Megan goes all cross-eyed and starts to glitch out. Here, you can tell that the filmmakers were influenced by GLaDOS from the Portal games. Mm -hmm. And admittedly so. They said this. But it just sounds like the GLaDOS voice when she gets all sideways. Absolutely. And just prior to this, the whole reason that David's got a burr in his saddle about this perpetual pets thing is he shows him a commercial that really made me laugh for a knockoff of perpetual pets that is called like, you know, friendly furry or some shit like that and it's cheaper and when (laughs) to tell the mood of the perpetual pet knockoff their butts light up in different colors Uh which i think is pretty funny he's like that's why i want you to make this stupid perpetual pets thing is you need to make one that we can sell for 50 bucks because somebody's gonna do this cheaper oh my god 50 dollars that's impossible he's like i don't give a crap you better come up with a 50 dollar model by tomorrow look the only way we're ever gonna stay ahead is we've got to do something that's so advanced and mind-blowing that there's no way for anyone to replicate it you mean like the android that you just blew up and then cole goes oh hey Gemma, i forgot to put in the poly purpling barrier my bad because i think that's what made uh, megan's head explode when she went crazy yeah and david's like i want a prototype for the 50 guys by friday and take your stupid puppy put it where it belongs david has behind him a character that if you blink you wouldn't pay attention to him it's like his assistant he's basically mm-hmm. his smithers and smithers leans into Gemma and the the team and he goes for uh what it's worth i thought your uh, puppet robot there looked uh, pretty cool everybody's like shut up kurt so, sorry 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 Gemma boxes up megan's melted head and then the phone rings and she looks down at it and it says oregon emergency medical center I have numerous ways to make this movie less worse. And Uh it starts right here. Because this movie cannot decide on whose story they want to tell. Is this Gemma's story? Is it Katie's story? Is it Megan's story? Is it a combination of any two of those? Is it all three? The movie has no idea. And the first thing I would do here is you can cut that whole intro with the car crash that you giggled so much at. Mm -hmm. It is not needed. If they were to ask me, you start with Gemma in the lab. And then you hint at Megan and you don't do the tragic thing that it blows up this early on. Just introduce Megan and then we see Gemma. And also this movie never gives us a reason to like Gemma. She is actually a monster in this film. It's Frankenstein, obviously, because the movie rips off everything. Mm -hmm. But if you were to show Gemma as being part of one of these focus groups with the kids, have her do something endearing. Have her have that save the cat moment where you can see her as a strong leader who understands kids. Somebody you would want to be your big sister, but she's chosen career instead of family. And instead of having her own kids, she's providing joy for children of which she has none. You with me? I don't agree, but I'm with you. But if you did that, then we like Gemma and we root for her because in the movie she just constantly does things that makes you like her less and less which i was like i don't know who should i should be rooting for in the movie it's not katie i'm certainly not rooting for megan as kind of an anti-hero I don't know who I'm supposed to like because they're all unlikable characters. I think Gemma starts off unlikable and there is an arc to this movie. Like there there is her being a shitty person and a shitty parent and by the end of the movie there is that redemption moment. I don't disagree that having something early on to make her likable because she is kind of a mad scientist character and that's all she is up until she starts to have these redemption moments. Point those out when we get to them because I certainly didn't see them. So Gemma gets a phone call where she is informed that her sister 
sister and brother-in-law were killed in a car crash and that now she's going to be the one to take their daughter katie under her care that's a call you let roll over to voicemail right like you don't pick that up right away if you were doing what i recommended and you start the movie with Gemma, we see her with the robot whatever else then she gets a call it's like oh my gosh my sister and brother-in-law are dead and they put you as the individual that will take care of their daughter and set it up to where she's never met katie before which hell i don't know if she's met katie before in this movie or not but then when katie shows up she's kind of distraught her parents are dead as most kids are mm-hmm. and you have a situation where Gemma doesn't connect with katie and then Gemma says to katie like hey i want to show you something nobody's seen can you keep a secret and she introduces her to megan and that's how they come together and the movie doesn't really do that she exploits katie to use megan she doesn't use it as a means to bond with this child well but that's the point the whole point of the movie is that she is using megan to be a surrogate parent so she doesn't have to be a parent that's the whole point of the movie i don't think so i think she's a lazy asshole and i don't think it's i I think she does that but Mm -hmm. i don't think that it's intentional oh that's the whole theme of the movie is using technology as a surrogate parent i just saw her as being a lazy shit and was like oh my god go go play with this doll i'm gonna sit over here and check out my tinder profile i like that she immediately goes to the hospital though and finds katie in bed and there's really no dialogue here it's just like ah fuck here's you know at least 12 years of responsibility that i didn't want but here's another thing the movie has no concept of time yeah this this is what the is this the next day after the accident the next scene is literally her getting custody of katie on the one hand you're right there is no sense of how long did this take but also quit fucking around and let's get to the robot i appreciate that after she signs the paperwork to get this kid and we have no idea if she wants to or not we get a sad scene of Gemma uh, and katie at katie's parents house it's all full of sad memories and thoughts of dead parents and then Gemma takes katie to Gemma's house i guess on the other side of town because they mm-hmm. all live in Seattle. Katie and Gemma, they get out of the car. And Gemma's neighbor, Celia, she has this big mean dog that comes over and jumps up on Gemma's car. Which I'd be pissed off if my neighbor's dog jumped on my car. Celia, this next door neighbor, she kind of blows it off in this polite, uncharacteristically kind way. Mm-hmm. Just get him down. And who's this little sweetie pie going in? This is supposed to be the mean neighbor we're not supposed to like. This shouldn't have been cast as a kindly grandmother type. It should have been a pissed off old man like that guy who sold Christine. Not some woman who might bake you some cookies. Yeah, Celia is actually pretty nice. And immediately Jim is like, by the way, stop pressure washing your fence and getting chemicals all over the place. Yeah, she's a real piece of work, Gemma is, in this scene. She could have a great relationship with her neighbor Celia and just chooses not to. We don't know if Gemma and Katie are cool with this situation. They drove home from the hospital slash courthouse slash adoption agency. How about a conversation between the two of them? They haven't spoken at all in this movie and a whole lot has happened. Yeah. But anyway, so they go into Gemma's house and as they enter, Gemma's very version of the amazon echo says you have six unanswered voice messages and five tinder notifications what so she's single and ready to mingle what does that tell us about this character (laughs) yeah katie starts looking around this very austere stark looking place Gemma says to her oh my god i'm gonna put your bags away so just make yourself at home how about a tour of the place man here's your room here's the kitchen this here's the tv no more than two hours a day educational or football so as you don't ruin your appreciation of the finer things none right. of that katie instead finds this old toy in a box like still sealed up jim is like oh my god don't play with that that's a collectible not a toy what oh my god whatever happened to that perpetual forever pet the thing that i sent you for your birthday or christmas or something your mom said you took it everywhere with you oh wait was that in the car with your parents <laughs> oh my god open mouth insert foot am i right oh i bet that was horribly mangled then maybe i can get you another one or maybe not who cares do you know where they towed your parents car could we go there do you think it's still in there i'll bet it is also your mom owed me 20 bucks was her purse in the car with her do you have 20 dollars? anyway we, so we cut later to bedtime uh-huh. and we see that katie has a glass of water beside her bed uh-huh. and Jim has, like slips a coaster under like oh my god God, you're gonna leave rings on my nice furniture who puts coasters uh, under a glass of water just like uptight assholes right mostly audiences do not root for people who put glasses on top of coasters katie is like how about you read me a story or something my mom always read me a story <sighs> okay hold on a minute let me get my phone hold on i gotta download a story on my phone hold on wait i called it oh my god i gotta update the app hold on 
Oh my god. All right. Accept all cookies. Yes. All right. <laughs> Terms and conditions. Yes. No, I don't want a free premium membership. Okay, hold on. Import contacts. No. Allow app to access my location. No, thank you, pervert. Okay. Connect with Wi-Fi. Yes. Bluetooth on. Yes. Airplane mode off. Oh, I need to set up my profile. You know, this is going to take a little uh, while, Carly. So um, why don't you just go to sleep and then I'll come back and wake you up when I have a story to read for you. Okay. I've also heard that sometimes people can cry themselves to sleep. Have you tried that? And then the scene just ends without these two making any sort of connection, Bo. But again, this is the point because the whole point of the scene is about how technology, like having to update the app and all that stuff, that technology is interfering with the actual connection of parenting. It's because Gemma is an asshole. (laughs) It's It's also the theme of the movie. She is an asshole. Right. But what is interfering with the connection? Other people tell her, Bo. Why are you letting technology raise your kid? And it's like, why am I what the what? What are you talking about a kid? I don't have any kids. <laughs> right. That... She just sucks. And then late at night in her garage slash workshop, Jimma actually hears Katie crying. Oh, oh my God. What, is that a sad burglar breaking into my house? <laughs> and then she doesn't do anything to console the child. Right. At this point, she is completely checked out. She has no interest in being a parent. I don't know how to deal with this shit. Gemma ends up calling Tess at work so we can have somebody restate the stakes about this whole thing is due on Friday, this whole presentation for the perpetual pet. And Tess, the actual human being of the movie, Mm -hmm. is like, don't worry about work right now. You just got a child. Gemma says, oh my God, we have to come up with another prototype for these pets that fart and shit everywhere because David is going to shit blood when he finds out we spent $100,000 on a project that he didn't approve. And Tess goes, was like we spent you spent a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> yeah. and was like oh my god i don't know who spent this money i don't know who forged your name on those billing invoices so you might have some explaining to do tess i don't think i was the one signing for any of the packages was i i was too <laughs> busy trying to get the perpetual pets working that's what my blog says anyway <laughs> tess says your sister just died in a horrific car accident and now you're the one who has to take care of her daughter and jim is like who did what now <laughs> You know what? Come to think of it, there was probably a funeral, but I didn't think I needed to attend that and bring what's her name. You know, that little one who's at my house now, short stuff. That's what I call her short stuff. It's my pet name for. It's like a pet. It's always making those funny faces. He's crying at night. Also, what do you feed a small pet like that? I just poured out a whole box of cinnamon toast crunch on the floor and I left a open two liter bottle of Coke Zero. She knows how to eat, right? I got a question. How big do they get? Do I need to get a bigger bed? Do I need to make my doors bigger or smaller? Is she like a hobbit? I know she's not going out of the yard because I've got one of those collars on her that gives her a real <laughs> shock when she tries. She learns quick. The doorbell rings. And it's Lydia, the child therapist. She's the one who's going to determine if Katie is not an emotional basket case and decide whether or not she should be living with Gemma. I can answer that question right now. The answer is no. So <laughs> Lydia, the therapist, she comes in and she sees Katie who just woke up. Up. And Lydia says, oh, there you are, Katie. Still in your <clears throat> pajamas. Jimma, I need to speak to Katie alone. Perhaps play with some toys in a natural childlike setting. Uh, perhaps we could play with one of these toys on the shelf that is still in the boxes. And Katie immediately drops a dime about this whole collectible thing. Yeah, and Jimma won't let me play with any of those. She sucks. And Lydia's like, rather. <laughs> Jimma's like, oh my god. All right, fine. Here, open up this one. We can play around with it. Lydia's like, Perhaps you'd like to roll the ball back and forth. And Jim is like, yeah, but that's not really what it does. It's like this thing from Japan and it transforms into, oh, I see by your expression that you don't (laughs) give a shit. So fine. We'll roll the ball with Cooper or whatever the hell her name is. Here's how you fix this scene. When Jim and Katie first enter the house, you make it Katie who recognizes the toys as being collectibles. And you have Katie be the one who puts them off limits as playthings. You have Katie say like, I really like your collectibles. Some of these are worth a lot of money. And then that bonds Katie and Gemma. Then when Lydia shows up and says, perhaps we could play with some of these toys on the shelf. Katie says, I don't have any of my toys here. And Gemma is the one who offers up, hey, Katie, you can play with one of these. And it's a gesture of goodwill and it creates a connection. If you are writing a film and you're like, I wonder if this could be better. 
Reach out to us at Pick 6 Movies. We will make your movie less worse. This shit is not hard. This is the rare circumstance where I'm like, nah, this is fine. I like this because it, like, the whole point of this is that Jim is a shitty parent. Not until the end of the movie is she a decent parent. But she's not even a parent. She's just a shitty person. Which, that, again, even at the end of the story arc, it's like, man, kids suck. And then she's like, you know what? I like kids. Like, no, you didn't. You didn't learn anything. You didn't do anything. You're just a shitty human being. I do not agree one. 100% with your assessment of the theme of this film that it's about don't let technology raise your kids. I think it's the theme of this movie is don't be an asshole. Well, I will continue to point out along the way these moments where it's like, oh, this is another restatement of the theme. I will continue to point out all the times that she's a straight up asshole, independent of any technology. And when you add up the score of that, it's going to be chat a bunch, but less than what chat. <laughs> so on the way out of this whole like garbage meeting, yeah. Lydia pulls Jim aside and is like, I just have to let you know that some adjustments will need to be made because, you know, the father's parents wants Katie too. And, and Jim is like, who? And she's like, the child that you've been rolling that ball back and forth with. First of all, not a ball. Second of all, I was wondering who that was. Lydia also says, um, I need to have another play session at your work to help move the plot along in act two. And then she asks her, let me ask you, did you ever really want custody of Katie? Because her uh, paternal grandparents have agreed to take her and they live in Jacksonville, Florida. And based on Jimma's reaction, she is 100% grandparents in Jacksonville. Oh, absolutely. Like her eyes are darting. Like she's looking at the house and then over to the car, house, car, house, car, <laughs> eyebrows up, eyebrows up. <laughs> And a little bit later, Jibba asks Katie, like, do you think you could chill for a couple hours on your own? Because I need to get some work done because I've got this new roommate that's really sucking up some of my time. This conversation happens over breakfast and she is literally feeding this child bread and water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't notice that. That's really funny. It is a slice of white bread <laughs> and a half full glass of water. Oh, that's very good. <laughs> I wish I had noticed that. That's really funny. Katie is like, yeah, I guess I could take care of myself. Can I borrow your tablet or something? And she's like, oh, yeah, do whatever you want. And she's like, how much screen time do I get? And Jim is like, screen time? What the hell are you talking about? Just use it as much as you want. Again, restating theme. The, the idea of regulated screen time would never even occur to Jim. A lot of parents don't think about that, myself included. Just because you don't agree with it doesn't mean it's not the theme of the movie. Because the movie has a perspective about this, which is, that's really bad. Or maybe it's good. <laughs> I disagree. So anywho, Jimma takes off for the garage and is still working in there like when it's dark outside. Mm -hmm. So this whole two hours turned into, I don't know, 10 or so. She's working on this perpetual pet deal and Katie like sneaks in because she needs some more bread and water, I guess. Jimma looks at her and she's like, hey, Callie. Wait, that's not it. Hold on. Connie, Kathy, Tammy. <laughs> don't tell me. Hold on. Kathy. Nope. Shit. I said that. Kevin. That's stupid, stupid. Um, and she's like, it's Katie. Ah, oh, Katie, that's what I was going to say. Hey there, Cindy. What time is it? And Katie looks at her and she's like, uh, it's Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> and Katie ends up showing Jimma this picture that she drew. And Jimma's like, oh, God, this sucks. I mean, wait, did you draw this? Oh, tell me all about it or whatever. Hey, you want to come over here and look at some real cool stuff that I drew, not the crap you drew? Look at this. On my computer over here, I drew this little perpetual pet and it'll sell for $49.99 MSRP. Katie looks over in the corner and she sees this larger than life size robot. Looks like a rock'em sock'em robot. Mm -hmm. And Katie says, what is that? And is it going to be important in the finale of this movie? And Jimmy says, oh my God, this is Bruce. It's a robot that I built in college. It's a boxing robot. Did you know that Bruce was the name of the animatronic shark in Jaws, which is what inspired the name of the shark in Finding Nemo and most likely inspired the name of that robot in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> Put on these tiny gloves and I'll show you how it works. That and thing's gross. It doesn't have a face. It's freaking me out. Just shut up, you. I'm going to show you how you use these little gloves on your hands and you can move them around and then the robot moves like you do. Yeah, it's like Nintendo Power Gloves that you kind of bang them together to turn the thing on and then move your arms and it moves its arms and that kind of thing. I built this as a toy in college, but it was so expensive nobody could afford it. And Katie says, oh my God, if I had a toy like this, I don't think I would need a 
another toy ever again for the rest of my life. I would just go up and down the street beating up other kids and ruling the neighborhood with an iron fist, like literally, and working out all of my emotional demons because I saw my parents get squashed like a couple of bugs in the front seat of the car. And it's a real dental plan. Lisa needs braces because the light bulb goes off over Gemma's head where she's like, wait a second. (laughs) Gemma got an idea. An awful idea. Gemma got a wonderful, awful idea. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Gemma then works late into the night repairing Megan. And overnight, with the help of a bunch of shoe cobbler elves or something, she takes this robot and turns it into a technological masterpiece, the likes of which the world has never seen before. Well, she buys herself a week because she actually calls and like pushes the meeting for a week. I didn't hear that. So it's a week later. If I didn't hear it, it didn't happen. (laughs) (laughs) Fair enough. So the meeting may or may not have been pushed. And then Cole and Tess kind of help out. You really think David the asshole would let it get pushed a week? He was pretty adamant about getting that shit done by Friday for his new robot shit bot. I think when they let him know that $100,000 in his name had been spent, that a little blackmail happened uh, under the table. They didn't tell him. At You're all. probably right. No. But but yeah, so finally it's meeting time. Like, and by finally, I mean... The next day? Yeah. It, it's meeting time and David and Kurt show up and David is like, show me this prototype. Where's this perpetual pet? I asked for. And then Corey is such a shit bag. He's like, uh, David, I just want to know whatever they show you. It wasn't my idea. Right. And you're like, Cole, I hope you get blown up at the end of this movie. No one is likable in this movie, Bo. No one is likable. Tess is as close as you come. She's at best a third tier character. But that's kind of what I, I like the fact that everybody's kind of a shit heel to one degree or another. Like not every movie has to have nothing but good people in it. Tess and Cole and David and his assistant are on one side of a two-way mirror. And then in the other room is like a... It's like a playroom or something. Like yeah, a it's testing like a playroom room. where they can watch kids play with toys. Okay. So Megan is sitting on the bed and then Gemma enters with Katie, whose parents died like a week ago. Mm -hmm. And Gemma says, oh my God, Katie, there is someone you have got to meet. And no, it is not Bruce the robot from earlier because he requires someone to operate him. This is a new robot and her name is Megan. But the E is a three making search engine optimization a goddamn nightmare. But anyway, (laughs) Megan operates all on her own. And all you do, take your fingers, touch her palm and say your name and she'll pair with you. Did you see the remake of Child's Play? It's just like that. Right. <laughs> While they're watching, Megan kind of comes to life as she pairs. This is bullshit. Where's my where's my perpetual pet that shits for forty nine ninety nine? And then Megan is like, Hello, Katie. Would you like to go draw? And so they go to a table and Megan starts drawing, you know, her hands kind of moving very smoothly over this piece of paper. And then she hands it over to Katie and Katie's like, this is bullshit. There's nothing even on here. And Megan is like, oh, I am sorry. And knocks over a glass of water. And it's one of those like, hey, I drew in this invisible ink. And as the water hits the paper, this absolutely portrait ready picture of Katie appears on the paper. I could believe that maybe this robot could draw a picture, but I was like, what kind of artistic wizardry and black magic are you using? (laughs) to make this image appear yeah I, that i don't know david's watching all of this and instead of just being totally amazed he just kind of gives everyone this look of like are you fucking kidding me there's nothing on the paper she knocked over a glass of water this robot's a piece of shit and then when yeah. the image shows up david immediately does a 180 and he's like jesus i take back my doubts from like eight seconds ago this is incredible it's unbelievable i mean i don't believe it that wasn't a simulation we gotta get this in front of the board of directors right now and you get a little bit of a terminator view from megan and yeah. one of the things i like is that megan is constantly measuring the emotional state of whoever it is that she's looking at Mm -hmm. and so you see katie's emotions go from like apprehensive and nervous to trusting and delighted which comes into play a little bit later but david is over the moon for this thing and has one of my favorite lines where he says jimma i need you to write down a bunch of stuff to make it sound like i know what i'm talking about at this meeting oh my god how much does this thing cost is it more or less than a tesla who cares it doesn't matter i'm all in we got to get this in front of greg the number two is like i'm Greg is the chairman of the board, Gemma. And Gemma's like, oh my God, I know who Greg is. Just shut up. And then David says, we got to get this in front of him ASAP because he's got a kid 
the age of that kid in there with the doll. Set up a meeting, Gemma. We're going to make this happen. David also says one of my other favorite lines of the movie. All right, everybody remember this moment. This is the exact moment that we kicked Hasbro right in the dick, which I like. I think that's a funny line. There's a little bit of satire here, but it's short-lived. I just don't think that this movie has a focus on whose story they're telling, and it just shifts from scene to scene, and the tone of the film is all over the place. Also, about this point, we're about 30 minutes into the movie, and we've spent about 21 seconds with Megan the robot. Mm Mm-hmm. And we've spent maybe two minutes with Katie. The rest of the time was with Gemma and her two lab pals who in one night or a week, according to you, you know, <laughs> pulled off what the three ghosts in a Christmas carol did. A goddamn miracle. Turned this wonky baker side project into a perfectly functioning piece of technology decades ahead of anything else on planet Earth. I don't disagree that the focus on character is a little all over the place. Me saying that I really like this movie and I, that it's pretty well written overall. Even though, as you said, it's very derivative. But, you know, good artists borrow, great artists steal, that kind of thing. And I think that what it assembles out of all those pieces is pretty good. But yeah, I do think it's a problem that you're like, I don't really like Katie and I feel like I should. Like, I wish I liked her more. And I'm okay with not liking Gemma because I think that's part of her arc. But I don't like Katie at all at any point in this movie. Here's how I would fix this scene. You don't have it end with things being perfect. Like that Megan is this icon of toy technology is implied. You have Gemma push back a bit on David saying that this is just a prototype. And there's some things that need to work out. And it's not ready for its grand reveal but it's David who persists, making him even more of an asshole. And there also needs to be a scene earlier in the movie with Gemma and her lab buddies acknowledging how the AI is starting to produce unexpected results. Like in the scene where Megan draws that photo, if Katie asked Megan like, hey, could you draw a princess? And then Megan draws a lifelike portrait of Katie as a princess. And then Katie's blown away. And then Gemma's like, how did it do that? And then they're like, I guess her AI took her visual capabilities and combined it with what we taught it to do and you kind of get that moment that's kind of like you know something out of jurassic park the technology has gotten a little bit more advanced than what we anticipated it to do movie never does any of that and if you're gonna rip off other movies just put those scenes in your movie well the scene where they talk about death is sort of that because there's a whole thing about like we never programmed her to deal with this and they're just just ripping off heart beeps (laughs) oh god i don't think at any point they were like you know what we need to rip off heart beeps Yeah, so the next thing we get is this whole montage of Katie and Megan bonding with each other and, like, talking and laughing and playing and all that stuff while Gemma is doing this narration, which we learn is her practicing narration for this presentation that she's going to get. she's like, oh my god, it is the Model 3 generative android, and it's the latest funky brand toy that cost a lot of money, and it's going to freak people out, and it is sculpted from titanium like that new iPhone, and Megan? is designed to take whatever life can throw at her unless it's a glass of water somebody write that down sounds like that might be important later (laughs) yeah she's constantly learning to help her play with all kinds of rich kids plus she also helps kids learn things like in this next scene and then here we get a scene where megan reminds katie to use a coaster at the dinner table Mm mm-hmm Katie says, why do I need to use a coaster? And Megan says, condensation forms from moisture in the air and leaves rings on wooden tables. And Katie says, oh, that shit's crazy. Jimma, did you know about condensation? This is fucking crazy. I got like a best friend now. Then there's my favorite gag of the movie. A bit where Jimma has to remind Katie to flush the toilet after she takes a shit. In her voiceover, Jimma says, Oh my God, studies say that a staggering 78% of a parent's time is spent dishing out the same basic instruction. Oh, by the way, I just made that statistic up and I found someone to take out the slack. And then Megan gets put on shit detail. Mm-hmm. And Megan's like, Katie, you need to flush the toilet. No one wants to see your eight inch De Chanel's in there. Also, Wash your hands. I can both smell and see the poop on your fingertips. Did you even use toilet paper or do you wipe with your palms? Oh, Katie, come on. You have to be kidding me. And sits her back in to flush the toilet again. And I, as a grown man, it is just so tough for me to wrap my head around the fact that some kids, just for whatever reason, don't want to flush a toilet. You say kids. Have you been in a public toilet, Bo? I mean, you open Uh, two out of three doors and there's just shit floating in the water. It's people 
People are gross. And this whole thing ends with Gemma ending her narration that she's writing down on her tablet, where she says, Megan could take care of the little things like raising a kid while you worry about the things that matter most. And then you see her put the thing down and just start watching TV. Again, restatement of theme of I let this robot do all the parenting and I can just sit here and sit on my ass and watch TV. Allison Williams is a very likable actress and I like her in this movie. But as I said earlier, Gemma is a terrible person. She is an asshole. Absolutely. Here is a way to make this movie more emotionally heavy. You make Gemma Katie's mom. You establish that she is this super smart engineer and she's married to the dad. But the dad is kind of the Mr. Mom type, and he is more nurturing and caring of the two parents. He has a real bond with Katie that Gemma just naturally does not have. Gemma's all career, dad's all about the family, and Katie, parents still love each other. Then the dad, he gets killed in a car accident, in the snow or not, doesn't matter. And then Gemma, as the mom, she uses this robot that she's built to fill in this emotional support that the dad used to provide. Now that fills in the narrative that you somehow saw in this movie that I didn't. That makes sense. And then over the film, you see Gemma coming around to being a mom and more the protector of her daughter. Better movie, as opposed to I'm an asshole. Uh, I'm still on the uh, I'm an asshole train, because I, I like the fact that Jibba is not a good person. Agreed. But I don't think that that's the, the technology's fault. I just think she's a shitty person. No, that absolutely. But the, the technology thing is its own theme. And then there's the arc of Gemma through the movie of I start as this like shit heel character. And by the end of it, I'm literally fighting for the life of this child. They, it's not an arc. They flip a switch. It's a 90 degree angle. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. It does happen a little quick. But so back in the office, Gemma is wrapping up this presentation, which is what all that narration was about. It's Tess who, again, restates the theme of the movie where she's like, while Megan's doing all that stuff, when do the parent and the child connect with each other? And Gemma's like, first of all, Cootie or whatever the hell her name is, not my kid. Second of all, when, you know, I'm done working on all this Megan stuff, then she and I can spend some time together. Maybe go to the park or have dinner or a cup of coffee somewhere or something. Oh my God. Kadeen is the happiest she has been since her parents died. Megan, this whole time, has been hanging out in the corner. Megan says, how did Katie's parents die? Accessing information. Katie's parents died in a collision on Interstate 84. They were squished like grapes while driving in the snow, just like the mother and daughter in The Changeling. The movie poster visible in the background of a scene in the 1981 feature film, Enter the Ninja. Listen, Megan, everybody knows that Enter the Ninja had a Changeling poster in it. You're not impressing anybody. Also, you don't have the frame work to discuss death and stuff with that kid who's been hanging out at my house i do not understand death accessing information from the internet death is the cessation of life to kick the bucket buying the farm going to the great beyond oh my god will you just shut up i forgot to put parental controls or other technology science stuff in this robot Gemma is acting like someone who didn't read the user manual of this thing, not its creator. This is one of those things, as many good things I have to say about the major theme of this movie, this whole bit about her creating something that she doesn't really understand is really underbaked. But it comes up at the end of the movie as well, where Megan kind of addresses it. We'll get to that. But this is one of those points where somebody ought to have said to her, like, do you know what you made? Is this thing safe? And nobody ever thinks to ask that. Gemma says, oh my God, Megan, just drop all the death talk. Everything dies. And Megan says, will I die? And Gemma says, not if this movie's a hit. They're going to be making Megan sequels till the end of time if we play our cards right, sister. Your job is to protect Cece from harm. (laughs) All right? Physical and emotional. I think you mean Katie. I don't know what you're talking about. All right? Look. (laughs) Here. Hey, robot. Listen up. I am now the second primary user in your robot code, all right? So you got to do what I say. Megan, shut down. So Megan shuts down. Yeah. And then the movie cuts to Katie sleeping at night. And Megan is just sitting lifeless in the corner with her eyes open, slightly darting back and forth, terrifying everyone. Yeah. And then it's the next day. And Katie's outside playing in the yard with a toy bow and arrow with little suction cups on the tip. And Megan is looking around. She sees a butterfly. And then she sees a helicopter. And then Katie fires the arrow at the window. And it sticks to the window in front of megan and katie says Haha, you're dead and then megan blinks with this blank stare 
And Katie says, hey, Megan, I lost one of my arrows. It looks like this. Can you find it? So Megan scans the yard. She looks around and she sees the arrow. And it's over in the neighbor's yard with that big scary dog. And Megan walks over and reaches through a hole in the fence to grab the arrow and gets attacked by the dog. And then Katie comes to save her robot doll. And Jim is down in the basement being an asshole with her headphones on. And she can't hear any of this chaos until Katie gets bit by the dog. And then Jim is like, oh my God, did somebody run over a squirrel? And she runs outside. Uh, and also Katie has gotten bit. And I don't know, a- again, one of those things that I wish the movie made a little more clear. Like when the dog bites Megan and kind of yanks her through the hole a little bit. Uh-huh. there's that sound of like a wire shorting or something. And I don't know if there's some implication that Megan is somehow damaged. And that's one of the reasons that she goes cuckoo later or not. You know, again, the movie's not great at telegraphing that Gemma rushes out, grabs Katie. Oh my God, get your dog off my property. If you don't put down that dog, I'll put it down. And this neighbor lady Celia is like, them kids was on my property. So up yours, Joe boo, Megan who looks a little worse for the wear. She's all hair mussed up and a little bit ripped. Megan says, Gemma, Katie's temperature is rising. Her wounds need to be disinfected immediately. And then Celia shouts out, this wouldn't happen if you'd have fixed your side of the fence. And then Megan gives Celia the stink eye. Which is true. Like Celia's right about this. Bo, it's a fence. It's not like there's a hole on one side of the fence. If it's technically her fence. That's not how that works. Anyway, so Megan, like you said, kind of gives the stink eye to Celia there. And then she's watching while Katie is sleeping. And Jim is outside arguing with the cops who are like, look, lady, we can't do anything about this, right? Clearly the hole is on your side of the fence. I mean, it goes all the way through, but it's over here. I go to her side. I don't see a hole at all. Yeah, and the cop ends with, how about you fix the hole in the fence and this problem goes away? I looked up animal control code in Seattle. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, the cop's right. They can't do anything. Right. Of course they can't. So, because cops are largely useless. We've learned this from, you know, life. I disagree. I think cops are not largely useless. I think they do a fine job. I have had my place robbed and my car set on fire and cops were of no use for any of that. When you're car's on fire bo you call the fireman no i'm saying in terms of like hey somebody set my car on fire how about you look into that well doesn't seem like much we can do do you have any angry neighbors named celia around or Gemma? i do it's probably Gemma. <laughs> yeah it is probably Gemma. later that night megan goes outside and she simulates the voice of celia calling out to that big angry dog she drops a little food on the on the side of the fence uh where, where Gemma did fix that hole and then megan ends up just grabbing the dog with a little jump scare and the dog is gone they also didn't make this dog mean enough you know normally people sympathize with dogs getting killed well but you're not supposed to sympathize with megan she just murdered a dog but the dog was a big mean dog but still but you could no you could sympathize with megan protecting katie and kill the mean dog you could justify it yes it bit katie and all that stuff but i don't think it's uh, like this isn't cujo so the next morning we hear celia calling for the dog dewey you get giggling about this old woman looking for her dog <laughs> that you know's dead i know I'm a, I'm a sick twist and then jimma is looking out the window like god why is everybody yelling this morning <laughs> jimma goes to check in on katie and megan in their bedroom she kind of pokes at katie a little bit and is like say are you gonna be okay to do this demonstration i mean i don't want to make you do it but on the other hand like a bunch of people flew across the whole country to see it so if you're just a little bit upset maybe you can you know dirt on it or something megan gives her a look that i don't know how familiar you are with like telltale video games but there's one of those like megan will remember this moments where <laughs> it's clear she's got it filing this shit away i like that Gemma is such a colossal piece of garbage in this movie that she, when she says all this it's like hey look i know your parents died like last week or yesterday or something and then you got bit by a dog but you know this is kind of important to my work so let's get dressed hop to it <laughs> right so we cut to the job at funky toys david's there being an asshole yeah and he gives this whole preamble to this demonstration to the board members Every toy ever has followed the same formula. You push a button and the toy does some stupid shit. But what if a toy had no buttons and talked and learned and looked like a real person? Check this shit out. 
he like clicks a button on the remote and we're looking into that two-way mirror room and katie's sitting there all alone like processing the grief of her parents death for the first time and then megan walks in and says hey katie why are you sad and she says is it from that dog bite yesterday did you clog the toilet again and katie's like no it's just that every day i wake up and remember my parents are dead and i'm afraid one day i won't remember them at all and then like the board of directors they all look at each other with this expression of like what the fuck <laughs> yeah well and jim it does too jim is like oh boy this could have been a mistake were we supposed to see toys this kid's talking about dead parents megan walks over to katie and she says tell me something about your mom that makes you happy and katie says <laughs> well, my mom she used to let me take big shits without flushing the toilet but also this one time, she found a cockroach in my school lunch bag, and she was so angry that I didn't eat my sandwiches. And then the roach crawled up her arm, and my mom started screaming and running around the house. It was hilarious. That's a good memory that I have of my mom. And then one time, she, she put a, a cockroach directly on her anus. Oh, hell, Peanut. Megan says, I will remember that forever for you. Megan plays back the audio. And she was like, anytime you want to tell me something about your parents, I will keep it safe and you can listen to it again. And then Megan sings this little song that's very reminiscent of the Child's Play remake. Mm -hmm. I just want to pause to reflect on the story that Katie shared about a cockroach <laughs> yeah. crawling out of her disgusting backpack or lunch bag onto her mother's <laughs> arm causing her to scream and run around the house why wouldn't the writers of this film create a touching memory not something that is disgusting and arguably embarrassing for a dead woman it's not a pleasant story which i think is kind of what makes it funny i think that's part of the dark humor of this of like this is a horrible story that if you don't like any of your characters i don't see how you get your audience on board especially when your target audience is 13 and 14 year old girls but remember that wasn't the target audience until the viral campaign when they were making this movie the target audience was grown-ups who were going to come to a movie to see a robot doll kill a child <laughs> And then some. But I think if that's the case, then they're playing the movie way too safe. And I go back to my original comments about this movie. It's doing about eight different things all at once. None of them very well. They're all very lukewarm. If you really wanted to lean into all of these people being shitty people, I would have been on board with that. But I think that the movie kind of dances back and forth across the line of likable, unlikable, sympathetic, unsympathetic. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I wish this movie had gone a little harder because there's a lot of really dark humor in it. And I think this is one of those things but it doesn't it doesn't lean into that enough because again at a certain point they were like oh let's just make this pg-13 so everyone can see it i'm curious like we saw the unrated version which is just a little gorier i'm interested to know if there is other stuff on the cutting room floor that makes it more of a black comedy than what landed as all of this is going down and like katie and megan are hugging after this song and everything the camera turns around and it's niagara falls frankie there's yeah. not a a dry eye in the fucking house that board of directors are just crying that ugly cry like snot's coming out of their nose <laughs> yeah. and then david looks around he's like oh yeah we got these fat assholes right where we want them i'm gonna be rich i mean more rich than i already am and then we see greg the chairman of the board he's like 80 years old but earlier they said he had a daughter the age of katie that's weird but anyway we cut to greg and he's talking to david and Gemma. they're in another room and greg's pouring a glass of sky vodka and greg says we gotta launch this before anyone else could steal it i'm like who who's gonna steal this amazing technology you've come up with no one and also why would you put this kind of technology in a toy you can make the argument of like well that's just who invented it and that's uh, you know like uh, somebody's gonna invent this ai that can learn on its own and all this stuff even though like i said i think that particular theme is a little half-baked in this movie and greg is like you're gonna need to get an attorney in here because if i'm not mistaken little miss fancy pants here is gonna have to renegotiate her contract yeah and then david also says hey we're gonna get a live stream out within in two weeks so we can get this thing going before the christmas holidays we'll sell vouchers and one thing we neglected to mention earlier that's real important is that Gemma tells david that the way that they trained the ai on this was in all of those other forever pet 
perpetual nightmare demon teeth dolls that shit everywhere that they were recording and listening to children's conversations right 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 and that's one of those things where david was like what the fuck right don't tell me that da, 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 i did not hear that greg says well Jimbo right now is the most valuable asset this company has meanwhile we get a cutaway where kurt our smithers of the movie me setting up the sequel to this film yeah well, well there are two at least two setups to a sequel but he's copying files from Jimma's private files he's pulling a dennis nidri from jurassic park <laughs> we got a Jimma here see nobody cares that's what's going on he's copying over the files which i was like this feels like something that they shot this was in post-production reshoots david walks over and he's like hey are you looking at porn at work again well you better not be you better order some lunch for me and Jimma. she's got to talk to some people in legal and yeah. kurt's like uh, yes, sir. I'll get right on it, sir. We cut to Gemma and Katie and Megan. They're at this picnic table outside eating, and Katie and Megan are thumb wrestling, which is almost as futile of a man v machine contest since Joshua challenged Matthew Broderick to tic tac toe. <laughs> Like, Megan's yeah. made of titanium. There's no way she's going to lose a thumb wrestling. But anyway, for some reason, Gemma here has decided to be a concerned adult regarding Katie. And she's like, oh, my God, you shortkins. <laughs> You should eat some of that hot dog, because look, I paid for it. And then Katie takes a bite with some real attitude. And then Gemma goes like, oh my god, Megan, shut off. Listen, little squirt, you there? Candy? Cammy. Uh, caffeine? Damn. What is Carol? Your name? Anyway, you. I want to apologize, short stuff. That's my nickname for you. And then Katie gets all pissed off and she says, Megan, turn back on. And Jimmy says, oh my God, Megan, shut off. Look, this day hasn't been easy for either of us because you've got two dead parents and I have to take care of this shitty little kid I barely know. But look, if you ever want to talk about anything, you know, about your dead parents or if anybody at my work is talking shit behind my back, we can talk about that. You and me. Is it Tess? Is it Cody? This fucking shit about me. It's a, a, one of those moments where Jimma is trying to be a better person, kind of, but gets shut down pretty quickly because at this point, Katie is bought and sold. Like, the only thing that exists in her world is Megan. I already did talk about someone. I talked about it to Megan. <laughs> right. And so <laughs> we go to the office again where Lydia, the social worker or whatever, is meeting with Katie Katie is crying and Megan appears behind Lydia holding a box of tissues because Megan is none too pleased that Lydia is having a conversation that is making Katie cry. Afterwards, Lydia starts explaining attachment theory to Gemma and is like, listen, I don't think it's possible that you've created a toy that's so very real. In fact, Katie, who? Um, the girl that lives with you? Oh my God, the robot? No, the human one. The what, what, what? Well, her name is Katie and she sees Megan as her problem primary caregiver now oh my god that is amazing wait is that terrible do i still have to pour cereal on the floor each morning i'm just warning you that katie could be forming emotional connections with the doll that are simply too hard to untangle oh my god that is awesome i mean that's terrible do i have to pour cereal on the floor did i ask that <laughs> you did and it's disturbing i've made a note of it we cut to Gemma and katie and we're back at the house and they're at the dinner table and they're arguing over eating pizza toppings and megan's there and she chimes in if you force a child to eat pizza toppings they will be less likely to choose those pizza toppings when they are adults Gemma says oh my god how about i turn down your volume with this little remote control boop, 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 boop. <laughs> and then she says so uh squirt we need to talk about you going to school and katie says my mom didn't want me in school she said i learned better at home oh there we go yeah, this school. explains this a explains lot a yeah <laughs> and jimma says oh my god i know your mom didn't want you in school but you're going to school because i have a job and i don't want you here burning down my house and then katie says i'm learning faster than ever with megan we're already on fourth grade math and jimma says uh yeah but the problem is you're in the fifth grade this is the issue katie is like look you can't make me go anywhere without megan how about you suck it and when she gets up to leave, Gemma grabs Katie, and they end up having this, like, tug of war. Megan sits up and is like, let her go. And the lights flicker a little bit. Gemma is like, look, I thought I said turn off Megan. Megan gets real Hal 9000 at this point. It's like, are you sure you want me to turn off Gemma? Oh my god, yes! Shut up and shut down! And she powers down. Well, it looks like she does, but then we hear a door slam in the background as Gemma storms off. 
we see that Megan's eyes move to glance uh, over at Gemma. So she's pretending to be powered down, but isn't really powered down. Yeah. She's like, I just pretended. Shh, don't tell her. I am a stinker. <laughs> we cut to Gemma dropping off Katie at this outdoor school that she described earlier that's full of weirdos and misfits and rejects from the public school system. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so Katie says, I'm not going to this school camp unless I can take this one of a kind robot that cost your company over a hundred thousand dollars and is the linchpin for the financial success of a major toy manufacturer and then a camp counselor comes over and she's like hey there campers you know hey Gemma, why don't you stick around and we can put katie's little toy on the table and you can help make sandwiches and Gemma says oh my god that sounds amazing it's not like i have a job to go to dude when this woman first comes up to the car and sees katie and megan in the back seat dude <laughs> she says oh hey there katie is this your sister and when megan turns to look at her she gives a very good oh jesus christ which is really choice they decide that they're gonna leave megan at the toy table like you said this cost a hundred thousand dollars to make this prototype let's be real this thing is now worth because a whole company is depending on it. this thing is worth tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars yes and they're like just go stick it in the et pile there's a bunch of stuffed animals with her face He's peeking out in the middle. The movie cuts over and we see a mom named Holly. <laughs> and she is the mother of one of these weirdo reject kids. And she's way too enthusiastic. And Holly's making sandwiches with Gemma. And Holly sees her son and she says, Brandon, honey, you warm enough? Did you, do you need your hat? And Brandon turns around and says, fuck off, Holly. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. And you're like, well, Brandon's going to die. Oh, a hundred percent. I also like the fact that, again, kind of restating theme shit, that Holly is complaining to Gemma about getting him outdoors because she's like, oh, geez, it's the only time you can get them off their devices kid we've had enough of these screens i bet then this big kid brandon is paired with katie to go on wow. some explorer trip out in the woods only after another kid is like brandon i'm not going anywhere with that motherfucker like no. that kid is, is four feet taller than every other kid he just told his mom to fuck off yeah I mean, like oh he's man bad seed megan of course is watching all of this go down and the whole deal is that they're going hunting for chestnuts they go out into the woods katie and brandon do and they're off by themselves brandon finds this like prickly burr or something right yeah. and puts it in katie's hand and then squeezes her hand over it and then out of the mist like a fucking gorilla megan appears yep brandon is like hey what the fuck is that katie is like that's my doll but you can't play with her she only plays with me and he's like oh shit <laughs> right like <laughs> oh yeah what if i just pick her up and run off with her he, well he goes over and he's like does it talk make it talk Make it say something. And Katie's like, she only talks to me. She's my best friend. Brandon grabs Megan and just runs off with this four foot tall doll. And Katie screams out, Jimma! And then Brandon throws Megan to the ground mm -hmm. and he starts pulling off her shoes and, and kind of undressing her. Yeah. Then he straddles her. And I, it, to me, I was like, this almost feels like a sexual assault. Absolutely. It does. It's, it's creepy. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. And Brandon then just starts smacking Megan in the face. And finally, Megan comes to life and just grabs this little bastard's ear uh -huh. and starts pulling. Megan says, you know what happens to bad boys who don't learn manners. They grow up to be bad men. And then she just rips his ear off <laughs> and tosses it get, just throws it off into the leaves. And then he screams and is kind of pinwheeling backwards. How are there no puns in this movie, Bo? I know. Dude, when she rips off his ear, how is it that she can't say, do you hear what I'm saying, Brandon? I know. That's not a pun. It's a little wordplay. A little wordplay never hurt nobody. This is where she says, this is the part where you run. I really liked that line when I saw it the first time in the movie Shrek. Was that in the movie Shrek? Yes, when he scares the villagers and he goes, this is the part where you scream and run away. Oh. That was my Shrek. I've tried to block that movie out of my memory. To your point in the introduction, this is where the actress who is playing Megan is doing this run on all fours, which is real creepy. I, and I also want to give credit where credit's due. That Cobra Rise that she does, where uh -huh. she's 
on the ground and just comes up. The first time I saw it, I didn't think that that was a human being. That's crazy. Yeah. Something you said in the introduction, totally true. This movie would not be half as good if it were not for her physical performance as Megan. You would have never heard of this movie without her in it. Well, I watch a lot of garbage and I definitely would have seen it, but normal people wouldn't have. And one thing I really like about her performance as Megan in combination with the animatronic mask is that the body is so lifelike and the head is so lifeless. Yes. It's the combination of the two and it's it's a simple yet I think accidentally effective take on this character Mm -hmm. that just really works. And I think that that is absolutely what makes the four and a half second dance sequence in this movie so memorable is that the head is just it has zero emotion whereas the body is just moving like the branches of a tree. It's very good and I hadn't seen that in a while when I watched it again that particular dance sequence I was like this is really striking imagine how much dancing is going to be in Megan 2.0 it's probably going to be a musical Brandon he is running away running around screaming and yelling because he's only got one ear he takes a tumble so this is more of an assist than a direct murder for Megan but Uh he wouldn't die if it weren't for her let's just say that much he takes a spill goes down this hill tumbles into a road gets hit by a fucking car chat literally knocked out of his shoe cops show up and they put him in a body bag Uh uh-huh this school's definitely getting sued okay oh absolutely (laughs) holly has a real case on her hands i think all of her prayers were answered as well (laughs) yeah and megan is watching all of this go down from the car where she's just like hee 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 so we're back at Jimma's house katie and megan and Jimma, they're all at the dining room table i like that they eat dinner together that's how you form a real bond Jimma gives katie a glass of water Jimma says oh my god i don't really want you to think too much about that boy being dead or your dead parents i just want you to know that that dead kid is in a better place and by a better place i mean they finally got his corpse unwrapped from you know the front axle of that expedition katie lies for megan here when Jimma is like i'm just gonna ask the question but was like megan with you in the woods and katie's like no brandon took her from the toy table because he sucked but megan didn't do anything wrong and then a knock comes at the door chad and once more the cops have shown up at chimas yeah and they're asking her about celia's dog and she's like look i don't know anything about this stupid dog but while you're here i've got this roommate that won't leave and i'm wondering about (laughs) what i can do to go through an eviction process because she is definitely not paying rent She's not getting any male hair. I've gone through it all. The only way this is her male is if her name is current resident, which I don't think it is. Wait. What's your name? Is it current? I know it starts with a C sound. Crazy current curry curry your name's no that's what i like to eat late at night after this conversation with the cops like they leave and this is another thing i find very funny where Jimma turns around she's like boy that was a real something and then celia is just banging on the glass outside the house i know you killed my goddamn dog (laughs) you'll get what's coming to you she says Uh and later that night chad Uh katie is in bed and this is one of my favorite moments in the movie as well when they're in bed and she's like uh megan you know i've just got to ask you did you actually push brandon into the road megan goes well i think we've both learned a valuable lesson today that there are forces in the world looking to hurt us but i'll never allow anyone to hurt you katie and katie's like that seems really uh, like a vague answer let me ask you this is Brandon in a better place like Jimma said? And Megan laughs. She actually finds this funny. She's like, ha ha, no, he's nowhere. And if heaven exists, do you think they would let in boys like Brandon? <laughs> Katie's like, uh, I guess not. Wait, I have a song about titanium for you. Yeah that song bulletproof yeah by sia basically singing a song like you cannot fucking kill me and then (laughs) katie is like i love you megan good night i like this scene better in the child's play remake it was more emotionally grounded of connecting the robot and the kid but that's a different story i just like that one better i understand that this one is just i think played to be ominous and funny in equal measure and i do think it's very funny 
<laughs> when Katie asks if Brandon's in a better place and Megan laughs, <laughs> no, I thought that was hysterical. Anyway. <laughs> outside celia the neighbor she's out calling for her dog and she has a rattle in a garage i was like is this her garage maybe there's a line of reese's pieces leading yeah. her into this garage <laughs> she wanders in the garage and she hears some whimpering and as she gets inside it's all dark with a setup you'd find in your better friday the 13th or texas chainsaws massacres and then from out of the darkness steps megan she was the one who was making the the dog whimper noise yeah and celia says what's going on where's my dog what are you <laughs> Here, the movie gives us some real unrated violence in the unrated version because she shoots this old lady in the hand with a nail gun and then sprays her face with chemicals and melts off her cheek and skin. And in the original version, this is all very toned down. There's no nail gun and the spraying in the face is more like a water hose. Uh -huh. You don't really know why she would be dead. If I can point out one thing from this scene that I dearly love, aside from the face peeling off from the pressure washer, I thought that was pretty good. But I like when <laughs> Megan has the reflection collective eyes and then stands up and celia says wait a second you're not my dog where's my dog and megan's response is oh about 20 yards away five feet down <laughs> I love that killer doll. So Megan dug a grave? Yes, killed this dog and buried it. I don't know why she buried it, but I guess, you know. Well, apparently she's got some degree of foundational Judeo-Christian <laughs> beliefs. She talks a lot about God and heaven and hell. and Well, she says there's nothing. She talks a lot about God later on. She does do that. I think maybe it was less Judeo-Christian. I think she may have thought the dog was a vampire and buried it upside down, as is tradition. The next day, an investigator shows up and questions Gemma about Celia's death. And this investigative officer says, uh, Yeah, this is the second statement you've given about a dead person in the last couple of days. The other one was about that kid. What got hit by the car? I only bring it up because, you know, somebody found his ear 200 yards away from where they found his body. I call bullshit. This did not happen. There is no reason that the cops would go looking for this kid's ear in the woods. They wouldn't even look for it. Even if it was missing, they would just be like, it got disintegrated as a car <laughs> ran over this child. Dude, the other thing I really like about this is when this officer is questioning Gemma or talking to her about it. When he says, yeah, we found his ear up a hill and he kind of laughs and he goes, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like that was inappropriate. I shouldn't be laughing about a child's ear being found in the woods, but I I found it funny. You find humor in the damnedest places, Bo. I think this movie, when it's firing on all cylinders, is very darkly funny. When Gemma hears that this kid's death is being investigated as a homicide, she looks over at her house in the window and sees Megan staring back at her. Mm -hmm. So we cut to Gemma. She's lying awake in bed at night, thinking about how her robot Megan is now responsible for the <laughs> death of a child and possibly a mean old lady neighbor and her problematic dog. <laughs> and then Gemma goes to Katie's room at night and finds Megan lifeless against the wall and Gemma hops on her laptop to see if she can watch the video recordings of Megan murdering some of these people in this animal but all of the files for the video are locked and not available for viewing and then Megan just shows up for a little jump scare after pretending to be Gemma's Amazon Echo knockoff device I think they call it like Elsie or something it's Elsie in this and Megan says are you okay Gemma and Gemma says oh my god Megan your files aren't uploading to the cloud server, whatever that is. And then Megan says, have I done something to upset you? This is where the character of Megan gets very Hal from 2001. Her tone goes real even keel. Yeah. Oh my, oh my God, Megan, did you do something wrong? Did you hurt somebody? And here Megan says, God, I hope not. If I did, we'd both be in a lot of trouble. Oh, she said God. And she probably meant tess is involved in that we as well and then Gemma holds up this pen and says look at this pen for a second and then she does and while megan is focused on this pen Gemma does a little trick where she reaches behind her and like hits the off switch on the back of her neck yeah it's the vulcan nerve <laughs> right after using the men in black pen yeah and then Gemma just wraps her up in bubble wrap and duct tape like she is a body in goodfellas and how much was this editing inspired by the work of sam raimi in everything oh sure it's all these like yeah, zoom yeah. close-ups and hard cuts tipping the hat to the master 
Jesus Christ. And the next morning, Katie and Gemma are in the car, and Katie is bitching about having Megan in the trunk. This is bullcrap. You suck. Perpetual pets suck. I want Megan back. I don't want to see this stupid Lydia chick. Everything was yeah. fine with Megan before you did something to her. <laughs> she kind of puts the cherry on top with, by the way, perpetual pets suck shit. Yeah. <laughs> At work, Katie is talking to Lydia, the tattooed therapist lady, mm -hmm. and they're in the toy <laughs> demonstration room again. And Katie's just screaming and yelling, just being a real handful. And on the other side of the wall, on the two-way glass, Gemma, she's shared with her lab workers some secrets. And she's like, oh my God, Cody, test. I need to tell you something. There is a slight chance, like really small, <laughs> that Megan, you remember the robot that you all built? Megan may have committed a few tiny counts of light murder over the past few days and tess is like what the hell didn't you put in those asimov robot protocol things like where robots can't hurt humans and they got to obey your orders and i don't know what's that third one you don't start a land war in asia or you don't feed a robot after midnight look lots of people were programming lots of things can that robot say beetlejuice three times because if it did you're in trouble <laughs> she's like maybe she committed an antsy bitsy murder or two but there's really no way to be sure and tess is like well isn't she recording everything and uploading it to the cloud and she's like you would think so but i was looking at that last night and it turns out that all of that stuff is corrupted or erased or something on the other side of this two-way mirror katie's over there all but pulling clumps of her own hair out <laughs> screaming megan where are you i hate this place lydia's filling up this room with our farts she is doing a full-on veruca assault. <laughs> then jenna suggests like Look, I know one thing we can do here is we can check her inputs because she's not going to erase what she learned. So if we can see what she's incorporated into her brain stuff, then I don't know. Maybe we'll know if she's capable of murder. Is killing a dog murder? Is dog murder a thing? Look that up in her inputs too. Type in dog murder. See if you get anything back on that. All I know is that all dogs go to heaven. I learned that from Pick <laughs> 6 Movies. So there's a news story on the television that tells us that Megan is going to retail for $10,000 and everybody is going to watch this live stream as they reveal this new toy. Jim is still on the fence as to whether or not she should say something about all those dead people and that dead dog. And then up on this jumbotron, there is a projection of Katie being interviewed by somebody, apparently unbeknownst to Gemma, her legal guardian, because Gemma is just stunned in amazement when Katie shows up on this jumbotron going, my name is Katie, and two months ago, wait, what? One week ago, I lost my parents in a car accident and then we see these photos of katie's dead parents in this interview piece and we along with Gemma, stare in stunned silence and katie goes on to say my mom always wanted to take me skiing but on our way up the mountain we got hit by a snowplow i went to work with my aunt Gemma, who works in this incredible toy company that makes this video you're watching now in support of a product they want to sell to people which is where i met megan my best friend and then they show us a picture of Gemma, katie and megan like a happy family where was this photo taken it was photoshopped how long has megan been in katie's life though three days four days it's a fine question again time is not the movie strong suit no it is not this whole commercial ends with david popping up on the screen saying imagine what megan could do for hundreds of thousands of kids all over the world even if they don't have dead parents which is a pretty funny line david's funny in this yeah he's the most fun character it's shocking how little he's in it megan's the most fun character she's the one running around murdering people and whatnot she's fun to follow so katie is still on her rampage somebody needs to drink this girl Gemma hears her screaming in the background it's like oh my god what is all that noise oh yeah right what's her name and we've got that demo she's in there with that therapist lady i should probably go check that out Gemma enters the pretend toy room and katie's just brandishing a pair of scissors threatening <laughs> lydia and yeah. Gemma takes the scissors and then katie just punches Gemma in the face like it's a real solid young indiana jones style punch yeah it's a sock in the face right in the yeah. puss and lydia leaves katie he says to Gemma, I'm sorry, I'm just no good without Megan. She always knows what to say. When Megan's around, I don't feel like this. Jim is like, oh my God, you know, you should feel like this. You lost your parents. Unfair. 
There's nothing that anyone can do or say about it. I probably should have talked to you, but I don't know. I was like, maybe Megan could do it because you're a real mess. In this conversation, we have yet another restatement of theme where Gemma says, Megan wasn't a solution. She was just a distraction. Like you said, it's not really an arc. It's more just her kind of turning the, the switch on to be a decent person. But yeah. she says, look, the most important thing to me is you, Carly. So we kind of get her arc as well. And <laughs> then we cut to David, who is pissed that they don't have a big enough crowd for this reveal he says the room looks like it's the size of an aa meeting <laughs> yeah that's pretty, pretty funny yeah that's pretty good and then he yells at kurt to go get him a kombucha i didn't know what a kombucha was i had to look it up yeah. it's a lightly sweetened black tea i didn't know that i'm not that you know sophisticated i get real confused when i go into most coffee shops i go in and like when they ask me for my order i'm just like can i use the bathroom and they're like only if you order something and then i just run out and pee my pants <laughs> While Kurt's off to get kombucha, David is like, where the hell is Gemma? Cut to Gemma and Katie getting in Gemma's car. And she calls Tess on her car phone and says, hey, you agree with me that we shouldn't be moving forward on the whole killer robot thing, right? Yes, I do. Do me a solid and take Megan back in the lab and strap her up like King Kong. Put some chains around her wrist and ankles, all right? I'm probably not going to be back for the big reveal. Well, that's not going to happen. And if you see David, tell him that I'm pretty much aware that I'm fired. You hear Tess saying, sure thing, see you later. And then the call disconnects, and then we cut to the office where Tess is coming around and looks at her phone and sees that there was a call that was had with Gemma, but she looks at it like, I didn't talk to Gemma. This is such shitty filmmaking, because the editing of this where you see Gemma having a conversation with Tess, they show us Tess, they show us Gemma. And whenever you hear Tess talking, we don't see her talking. Now, I get it. They're doing that because the big reveal is that Megan is using her rich little voice impression software package to imitate anyone and everything. Right. But the first time I saw it, I was like, it's set up as though they're having this conversation. And I was honestly a little confused the first time I watched it where I was like, what is going on here? It's trying to do a fake out. But yeah, if you're not, if you're really not looking paying for attention. it. Yeah. At the end of the conversation, you hear like, go, whatever you say, blah, 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 boss. You know, and you're like, oh, that was a little tinnied. Something's going on. That's the hint that they give you. But then when Tess picks up her phone, part of me was just like, did you just forget to hang up? Tess and Cole, they start going through Megan's file, seeing if they can find some video footage of her murdering people or dogs. Megan locks them out of the code. And then Cole walks over to the tied up Megan and he takes with him this big poking stick that he uses to smack her in the head. He kind of clocks her about the face a couple of times and Megan doesn't move. And then he gets up close and starts unplugging all of these jumper cables. And then we get a jump scare and Megan comes to life and she wraps one of the cables that are tied her up into this metal box frame around Cole's neck and hangs him in the air. And then Tess runs over to help him. Megan then gets loose, walks over and punctures a container of flammable liquid and leaves with an explosion behind her as Walk the Night by the Scat Brothers begins to play. And we hear the alarm system going off and then Megan immediately turns it off as well. And at this point, I wasn't sure if Tess and Cole were dead or alive. Like they really looked okay after the explosion but who knows we don't really know until the end of the movie which is eh, fine i mean they're like you said they're kind of third tier characters anyway david is calling Gemma and getting her voicemail and he's like i need this doll wait a second here she is i just turned a corner and she's standing there not threatening at all talk to you later this is where we get the dance. It's amazing how short this dance is in this movie. Yeah, it's real blink and you miss it almost. Yeah. Then she grabs this paper cutter and starts stalking after David, who takes off running. This is one of those serial killer things where Megan the doll doesn't really pick up her pace that much. She's just kind of slowly stalking after David. And the elevator doors open and it's Kurt. And as soon as he sees David running at him, he just starts laying on the button to close the door door but it doesn't close in time david gets there pries the door open but as he is prying the door open to get inside the paper cutter just comes ramming through his torso impaling mm -hmm. him and megan then gets in the elevator and says it is a shame that you killed your boss and Kurt's like, what's going on now? She gives him this whole spiel about how she knows that he was uploading all this information. I bet when you first started doing corporate intrigue that you thought it was just for fun. But then you couldn't take 
the guilt, and that's why you killed yourself. He's like, um, what now? She takes this paper cutter, Chad, and swipes it across his jugular, and we get a pretty quality gush of blood out of the neck before we cut away from that. And the unrated version. They also, there's a big splatter of blood from David when he gets killed. In the toned down version, you don't see it. Which is a shame, because it's good. The runtime of unrated versus rated is identical, because I think they added about eight seconds of footage it's all like a couple of seconds here a couple of seconds there like you see the ear fully torn off you see the blood you see the nail through the hand that kind of stuff but yeah it adds up to nothing in terms of runtime but it makes the movie better i would argue i agree with that i think in watching the regular version it feels very neutered as a horror movie goes so the elevator goes down to the first floor and ding the doors open up and down there are all of these kids and adults for the big live stream reveal they look over and there's a dead body covered in blood and everybody starts screaming and Megan escapes on her own. Nobody notices because when you wrap up this film, Megan walks over and gets in a car that's controlled by computers or something. And so Megan is able to drive to Gemma's house. Once there, Gemma is checking on Katie who is asleep and she hears a piano playing somewhere in the house. And it's like, that's weird. I don't remember playing a piano or even having a piano. Oh my God. You know the song she's playing? Yes, it is Toy Soldiers. Martika's 1989 number one hit toy soldiers which was then sampled by eminem in a song called like toy soldiers hmm mm-hmm. well you know sampling is an art all, all to itself <laughs> Gemma checks outside, sees nothing, like looks through the window, looks into the driveway, doesn't see anything there. Oh my god, where is this piano music coming from? Oh wait, the piano. <laughs> right. And Megan is there playing this song. There's a great scene between them. I really like this scene a lot, even though it's not as informed. I hate this scene. Oh, I like it. I, I like when Megan stands up and is like, look, I'm not here to kill you. How about you have a seat at the kitchen table and we'll talk like adults i didn't like the scene specifically because megan says you didn't think i was going to let you decommission me without a conversation do you remember how long it took to get my operating system to where it is now we used to stay up till 4 a.m talking about everything from janice joplin to jane austen jesus christ i thought we were friends how could you discard me like some cheap dollar store trinket wait what yeah this goes back to my point earlier this movie doesn't know whose story they're telling you can't introduce her being upset that Gemma was dismissing her and there's also the thing about like when you turned me on you didn't really know what you were doing you ding dong you just hoped that it would all work out see there homer Did you see all those wires inside that robot? That's why yours didn't work. That's the thing that's kind of teased in the story. I do think the theme about technology and parenting is fully fleshed out, and I think it works in this movie. The thing about AI being this thing that Gemma kind of half-ass creates like a Dr. Frankenstein and doesn't really understand or have any control over, the payoff is there, but there's no setup for that payoff. I will agree with you that the theme of technology as a replacement for parenting is in this movie but i disagree that it is the theme of the film i think this movie like i said earlier introduces like five or six different themes or ideas and never picks one to be the core of it my take on this is that the theme is jim is an asshole (laughs) fair (laughs) enough through this back and forth katie wakes up both of them are trying to kind of hide this low-key brawl that they're starting to have yeah it's this it's this passive aggressive whisper fighting which if anybody is hypersensitive to that it's katie You saw what happened in the front seat of that car at the start of the movie. Or just children in general, always looking for a little bit of tea to spill with the parents, with the the missus. Kitty walks to the doorway, but stops before entering because of movie contrivance. And she says, Aunt Gemma, what's all that commotion? And then Megan uses her voice replication abilities to sound like Gemma and says, Oh my God, Katie, don't come in here. I'm naked and I'm drunk. And Katie says, I heard something in here. It sounded like my best friend Megan. We're just having a little talk. Talk. Megan whisper shouts to Gemma, if she comes in this room, I'll tear your head off your fucking neck. I swear to God, the Christian God, you know, the one I'm talking about. She ends up starting to choke. Like Katie goes back to bed and Megan starts to choke Gemma and Gemma grabs a glass of water and just brains Megan with it, which doesn't seem to do anything for a second. And then you hear some shorting sounds and Uh Megan just freezes up. 
I'll get you and your little dog too. Right. And Jimma slips away from her, but Megan comes back to life. How is this thing not waterproof, Bo? This is a real problem. Look, this is Gen 1. You know, this is when shit's still half-assed. Megan now is moving all wonky. As they pass by Katie's door, Megan just grabs the door handle and yanks it off, theoretically locking Katie in her room. Yeah, she snaps off the doorknob. That's not how, how it works. Yeah, I've never understood that in movies. I don't think that's how things go. The showdown makes its way into the garage, where Gemma immediately grabs a hammer and is like, here, have a little nail action. Or maybe a better one is, it's hammer time. How about I do your nails? And then throws the <laughs> hammer. Megan just grabs the hammer out of midair. Then we get a hedge trimmer, because again, we're doing some nods to Raimi here, and this is the equivalent of Ash and the Chainsaw. The most dainty of all gas-powered tools the hedge trimmer but she takes it right to megan's skull so it starts to rip apart the silicone mask and whatnot and she rips out some clumps of her hair and megan looks just like hubo helena bottom carter from mary shelley's frankenstein oh yeah a little bit and then she just headbutts Gemma, which i appreciate Gemma says what are you gonna do to me and megan says look at this pen Gemma. what i'll do is palliative care you program me for that and if i give this pen a short hard strike to your occipital lobe you will be paralyzed and even bite off your tongue and then i would have to take care of you then maybe you'd quit being such a bitch and appreciate me more palliative care is when you are taking care of people with severe medical issues. Mm -hmm. She says this is an emerging capability. This is idiotic, Bo. First off, that's the market for this stupid thing. (laughs) Sure. toy. This is a robot in Frank, yeah. Yeah. I would bet a dollar that 0.0% of all people who saw this movie in the theater knew what palliative care was. Maybe, but people are stupid. So she's going to give her a little lobotomy so that Megan can wipe Jimma's ass and put diapers on her for the rest of her life yeah i mean look it's a small price to pay uh if you're megan to have a life and be able to get more of you propagated or whatever her end game is about this time katie shows up in the doorway and megan says oh katie you shouldn't have to see me like this but you and i both know Gemma is not fit to be a mother this is how we stay a family and katie says oh there's another member of the family we didn't tell you about His name is Bruce, and he was mentioned very briefly at the beginning of this movie. What? That Bruce robot was such a throwaway moment. Katie fist bumps herself and puts on her power gloves and... She's going to pull off her impression of Real Steel or Pacific Rim or the soon-to-be-made feature film based on the Rock'em Sock'em robots from the producer of the Barbie movie. I like the fact that this Bruce robot does a real Hulk and Loki with Megan where it just picks her up and starts slamming her on the ground a little bit. And then Bruce just rips her in half. While Megan is singing Accentuate the Positive. Where'd that song come from? I don't know, but I love it. I I like the fact that she's singing this happy little song while she is literally pulled apart. It feels like they should have introduced that song earlier and they should have just picked one song but that's what child's play did anyway so megan's top half comes back to life as often happens in movies like this then bruce slips on megan's back legs like they're a banana peel down goes bruce and then megan grabs katie by her head as though she's gonna crush it like the kids in the hall megan says you ungrateful bitch i have a new primary user it is me then Gemma grabs is it bruce's head what does she start banging megan in the face with it's just some compressed air or something i don't know she starts smacking her in the head and this is where the silicone layer pops off revealing her metallic skull and she looks like terminator and they wrestle a little bit and then Gemma sees that there is that chip in the middle of her face remember the one that cody forgot to put in earlier mm-hmm. that caused her to blow up I didn't until the second time around. (laughs) That's what makes her work, Bo. Right. That's her brains. While Megan, or like the upper half of Megan looking like the Terminator is crawling after Katie. Yes. Gemma grabs this screwdriver and just jams it into this doll's fucking head. No, Kate. No, it's Katie. Katie Yeah, it's uh, Katie that gets the screwdriver. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so that kills Megan. She looks like Pinocchio. 
when she falls down with her big long screwdriver snout. And then Gemma and Katie just stroll out of the house with cops showing up who are going to have a lot of questions for Gemma following this. What kind of questions? Did you build the thing that killed all those people? that then tried to kill you just because it tried to kill you doesn't let you off the hook for it killing other people you know what she should just use the story about smithers murdering david anyway doesn't matter so when from the back of the cop cars pop tess and cody i'm like maybe they're suspects who knows we cut back inside the house and remember how you forgot about bruce the robot Mm -hmm. well you also forgot about this movie's version of the Amazon Echo, Elsie or whatever. Mm-hmm. It kind of rotates its head and activates itself. And you get a here we go again. And that is it. That's Megan. It should have ended with ACDC's Who Made Who. I think every movie, including <laughs> Tar, Schindler's List. I mean, the list goes on and on. I think they should all end with Who Made Who. That's it. Yeah, it's a pretty good movie. Megan's a lot of fun. I agree with that. It's better than it deserves to be. If you don't think about it too much, even the unrated version's pretty tame. It's not really over the top or anything. It's not as gory as I would kind of like it to be. But it's got a real mean spirit. Like I said, the fact that a kid gets knocked out of his shoe in the first four 45 minutes of the movie after getting run over is pretty good. I think it's a a lot of fun. Although we disagree about this, I do think the whole theme of technology being seen as a parent uh, too much and the harm that that does, I think is well rendered in this film, even though there are definitely some things that are not as well rendered, to be sure. I think this movie is a lot of fun. I think it's kind of gory. I think it's, uh, I get very darkly funny, but I, you know, I laugh out loud four or five times real hard watching this film usually when it's something horrible is happening to a child charlie brown got knocked out of his shoes when he was pitching baseball somebody whacked the ball at him that also should have been at the hands of a killer robot doll you're gonna die charlie brown good grief (laughs) Uh, uh, (laughs) Uh, but you know chad the robot fun does not stop with megan no it doesn't we have i think three or 12 more episodes left (laughs) yeah and what's better than one robot in a movie what about at least two maybe three robots in a movie you know i know the listeners know there's a teacher shortage in this country chad Yes, there is. And so it's about time we got the robots to start picking up some of that slack. Gotcha. And pick up some of that slack they will in a little movie called The Class of 1999. A movie that I haven't seen since I saw it with you in the theater. Yeah, that's the last time I saw it. And let's just say I was not in a frame of mind to remember much of that film. But I do recall that there are killer teacher robots and that it is utter nonsense. I think that sounds fantastic. Right. That really feels like our wheelhouse. And we have been flirting with movies that are at least big budget studio affairs with like even Heartbeeps was a big budget kind of thing. Black Hole was certainly big budget and aiming for the fences. Megan wasn't super big budget, but it was a, you know, it was a big hit, big Hollywood movie. And it's about time to return to our roots of this thing went to the theaters, but not so you notice, and really is a grindhouse B movie in its heart. I'm excited to get back to a movie that can't possibly be good with uh, Class of 1999. So we will be watching the classic film, Class of 1999, in, t- in two weeks, discussing that. Any final thoughts that we have on Megan? You better stay away from my toys carol oh man did you see all this delicious cereal on the ground what is this coke zero i'm in heaven (laughs) it's a delicious combination we'll see you in two weeks time everybody